This is Audible. Blockchain, the complete guide to uncovering Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin technology, and the future of money. Written by Alan Wright and Andrew Johnson. Narrated by Scott Miller and Nikki Gaio. This book is a collection of the two books, Blockchain, Uncovering Blockchain Technology, Cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, and the Future of Money, Blockchain Cryptocurrency Exposed by Alan Wright, and Cryptocurrency, How to Make a Lot of Money Investing and Trading in Cryptocurrency, Unlocking the Lucrative World of Cryptocurrency by Andrew Johnson. Blockchain. Uncovering Blockchain Technology, Cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, and the Future of Money. Blockchain and Cryptocurrency Exposed. Blockchain and Cryptocurrency as the Future of Money, Book One. Written by Alan Wright, narrated by Scott Miller. Chapter One. History of Blockchain. Many of the technologies we now take for granted were quiet revolutions in their time. Just think about how much smartphones have changed the way we live and work. It used to be that when people were out of the office, they were gone because a telephone was tied to a place, not to a person. Now we have global nomads building new businesses straight from their phones. And to think, smartphones have been around for merely a decade. We're now in the midst of another quiet revolution. Blockchain, a distributed database that maintains a continuously growing list of ordered records called blocks. Consider what's happened in just the past 10 years. The first major blockchain innovation was Bitcoin, a digital currency experiment. The market cap of Bitcoin now hovers between 10 and 20 billion dollars and is used by millions of people for payments, including a large and growing remittances market. The second innovation was called blockchain, which was essentially the realization that the underlying technology that operated Bitcoin could be separated from the currency and used for all kinds of other inter-organizational cooperation. Almost every major financial institution in the world is doing blockchain research at the moment, and 15% of banks are expected to be using blockchain in 2017. The third innovation was called the smart contract, embodied in a second-generation blockchain system called Ethereum, which built little computer programs directly into blockchain that allowed financial instruments like loans or bonds to be represented rather than only the cash-like tokens of the Bitcoin. The Ethereum smart contract platform now has a market cap of around a billion dollars, with hundreds of projects headed toward the market. The fourth major innovation, the current cutting edge of blockchain thinking, is called proof of stake. Current generation blockchains are secured by proof of work, in which the group with the largest total computing power makes the decisions. These groups are called miners and operate vast data centers to provide this security in exchange for cryptocurrency payments. The new systems do away with these data centers, replacing them with complex financial instruments for a similar or even higher degree of security. Proof-of-stake systems are expected to go live later this year. The fifth major innovation on the horizon is called blockchain scaling. Right now, in the blockchain world, every computer in the network processes every transaction. This is slow. A scaled blockchain accelerates the process without sacrificing security by figuring out how many computers are necessary to validate each transaction and dividing up the work efficiently. To manage this without compromising the legendary security and robustness of blockchain is a difficult problem but not an intractable one. A scaled blockchain is expected to be fast enough to power the Internet of Things and go head-to-head -head with the major payment middlemen, Visa and Swift, of the banking world. This innovation landscape represents just 10 years of work by an elite group of computer scientists, cryptographers, and mathematicians. As the full potential of these breakthroughs hits society, things are sure to get a little weird. Self-driving cars and drones will use blockchains to pay for services, like charging stations and landing pads. International currency transfers will go from taking days to an hour, 
and then to a few minutes with a higher degree of reliability than the current system has been able to manage. These changes and others represent a pervasive lowering of transaction costs. When transaction costs drop past invisible thresholds, there will be sudden, dramatic, hard to predict aggregations and disaggregations of existing business models. For example, auctions used to be narrow and local rather than universal and global as they are now on sites like eBay. As the cost of reaching people drop, there was a sudden change in the system. The blockchain is reasonably expected to trigger as many of these cascades as e-commerce has done since it was invented in the late 1990s. Predicting what direction it will all take is hard. Did anybody see social media coming? Who would have predicted that clicking on our friends' faces would replace time spent in front of the TV? Predictors usually overestimate how fast things will happen and underestimate the long-term impacts. But the sense of scale inside the blockchain industry is that the changes coming will be as large as the original invention of the Internet, and this may not be overstated. What we can predict is that as blockchain matures and more people catch on to this new mode of collaboration, it will extend into everything from supply chains to provably fair Internet dating, eliminating the possibility of fake profiles and other underhanded techniques. And given how far blockchain has come in 10 years, perhaps the future could indeed arrive sooner than any of us think. Until the late 1990s, it was impossible to process a credit card securely on the Internet. E-commerce simply did not exist. How fast could blockchain bring about another revolutionary change? Consider that Dubai's blockchain strategy is to issue all government documents on blockchain by 2020 with substantial initial products just announced to go live this year. The Internet of Agreements concept presented at the World Government Summit builds on this strategy to envision a substantial transformation of global trade using blockchains to smooth out some of the bumps caused by Brexit and the recent U.S. withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. These ambitious agendas will have to be proven in practice, but the expectation in Dubai is that cost savings and innovation benefits will more than justify the cost of experimentation. As Mariana Mazzucato teaches in The Entrepreneurial State, the cutting edge of innovation, particularly in infrastructure, is often in the hands of the state, and that seems destined to be true in the blockchain space. Chapter 2 Introduction to Blockchain Crypto what? If you've attempted to dive into this mysterious thing called blockchain, you'd be forgiven for recoiling in horror at the sheer opaqueness of the technical jargon that is often used to frame it. So before we get into what a cryptocurrency is and how blockchain technology might change the world, let's discuss what blockchain actually is. In the simplest terms, a blockchain is a digital ledger of transactions, not unlike the ledgers we've been using for hundreds of years to record sales and purchases. The function of this digital ledger is, in fact, pretty much identical to a traditional ledger in that it records debits and credits between people. That is the core concept behind blockchain. The difference is who holds the ledger and who verifies the transactions. With traditional transactions, a payment from one person to another involves some kind of intermediary to facilitate the transaction. Let's say Rob wants to transfer 20 pounds sterling to Melanie. He can either give her cash in the form of a 20 pound note, or he can use some kind of banking app to transfer the money directly to her bank account. In both cases, a bank is an intermediary verifying the transaction. Rob's funds are verified when he takes the money out of a cash machine, or they are verified by the app when he makes the digital transfer. The bank decides if the transaction should go ahead. The bank also holds the record of all transactions made by Rob and is solely responsible for updating it whenever Rob pays someone or receives money into his account. In other words, the bank holds and controls the ledger, and everything flows through the bank. That's a lot of responsibility. So it's important that Rob feels he can trust his bank, otherwise he would not risk his money with them. 
He needs to feel confident that the bank will not defraud him, will not lose his money, will not be robbed, and will not disappear overnight. This need for trust has underpinned pretty much every major behavior and facet of the monolithic finance industry, to the extent that even when it was discovered that banks were being irresponsible with our money during the financial crisis of 2008, the government, another intermediary, chose to bail them out rather than risk destroying the final fragments of trust by letting them collapse. Blockchains operate differently in one key respect. They are entirely decentralized. There is no central clearinghouse like a bank and there is no central ledger held by one entity. Instead, the ledger is distributed across a vast network of computers called nodes, each of which holds a copy of the entire ledger on their respective hard drives. These nodes are connected to one another via a piece of software called a peer-to-peer, -peer, P2P, client, which synchronizes data across the network of nodes and makes sure that everybody has the same version of the ledger at any given point in time. When a new transaction is entered into a blockchain, it is first encrypted using state-of-the-art cryptographic technology. Once encrypted, the transaction is converted to something called a block, which is basically the term used for an encrypted group of new transactions. That block is then sent or broadcast into the network of computer nodes, where it is verified by the nodes and, once verified, passed on through the network so that the block can be added to the end of the ledger on everybody's computer under the list of all previous blocks. This is called the chain. Hence, the tech is referred to as a blockchain. Once approved and recorded into the ledger, the transaction can be completed. This is how cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin work. Accountability and the removal of trust. What are the advantages of this system over a banking or central clearing system? Why would Rob use Bitcoin instead of normal currency? The answer is trust. As mentioned before with the banking system, it is critical that Rob trusts his bank to protect his money and handle it properly. To ensure this happens, enormous regulatory systems exist to verify the actions of the banks and ensure they are fit for purpose. Governments then regulate the regulators, creating a sort of tiered system of checks whose sole purpose is to help prevent mistakes and bad behavior. In other words, organizations like the Financial Services Authority exist precisely because banks can't be trusted on their own. And banks frequently make mistakes and misbehave, as we have seen too many times. When you have a single source of authority, power tends to get abused or misused. The trust relationship between people and banks is awkward and precarious. We don't really trust them, but we don't feel there's much alternative. Blockchain systems, on the other hand, don't need you to trust them at all. All transactions or blocks in a blockchain are verified by the nodes in the network before being added to the ledger, which means there is no single point of failure and no single approval channel. If a hacker wanted to successfully tamper with the ledger on a blockchain, they would have to simultaneously hack millions of computers, which is almost impossible. A hacker would also be pretty much unable to bring a blockchain network down, as again, they would need to be able to shut down every single computer in a network of computers distributed around the world. The encryption process itself is also a key factor. Blockchains, like the Bitcoin one, use deliberately difficult processes for their verification procedure. In the case of Bitcoin, blocks are verified by nodes performing a deliberate processor and time-intensive series of calculations often in the form of puzzles or complex mathematical problems, which mean that verification is neither instant nor accessible. Nodes that do commit the resource to verification of blocks are rewarded with a transaction fee and a bounty of newly minted bitcoins. This has the function of both incentivizing people to become nodes, because processing blocks like this require pretty powerful computers and a lot of electricity, whilst also handling the process of generating or minting units of the currency. This is referred to as mining because it involves a considerable amount of effort, by a computer in this case, to produce a new commodity. 
It also means that transactions are verified by the most independent way possible, more independent than a government-regulated organization like the FSA. This decentralized, democratic, and highly secure nature of blockchains means that they can function without the need for regulation. They are self-regulating, government or other opaque intermediary. They work because people don't trust each other rather than in spite of. Let the significance of that sink in for a while and the excitement about blockchain starts to make sense. Smart contracts. Where things get really interesting is the applications of blockchain beyond cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Given that one of the underlying principles of the blockchain system is the secure, independent verification of a transaction, it's easy to imagine other ways in which this type of process can be valuable. Unsurprisingly, many such applications are already in use or development. Some of the best ones are smart contracts. Ethereum, probably the most exciting blockchain development after Bitcoin. Smart contracts are blocks that contain code that must be executed in order for the contract to be fulfilled. The code can be anything, as long as a computer can execute it. But in simple terms, it means that you can use blockchain technology with its independent verification, trustless architecture, and security to create a kind of escrow system for any kind of transaction. As an example, if you're a web designer, you could create a contract that verifies if a new client's website is launched or not, and then automatically release the funds to you once it is. No more chasing or invoicing. Smart contracts are also being used to prove ownership of an asset such as property or art. The potential for reducing fraud with this approach is enormous. Cloud storage, storage. Cloud computing has revolutionized the web and brought about the advent of big data, which has, in turn, kick-started the new AI revolution. But most cloud-based systems are run on servers stored in single-location server farms, owned by a single entity, Amazon, Rackspace, Google, etc. This presents all the same problems as the banking system, in that your data is controlled by a single, opaque organization, which represents a single point of failure. Distributing data on a blockchain removes the trust issue entirely and also promises to increase reliability as it is so much harder to take a blockchain network down. Digital Identification Show card Two of the biggest issues of our time are identity theft and data protection. With vast centralized services such as Facebook holding so much data about us and efforts by various developed world governments to store digital information about their citizens in a central database, the potential for abuse of our personal data is terrifying. Blockchain technology offers a potential solution to this. By wrapping your key data up into an encrypted block that can be verified by the blockchain network whenever you need to prove your identity. The applications of this range from the obvious replacement of passports and ID cards to other areas, such as replacing passwords. It could be huge. Digital voting. Highly topical in the wake of the investigation into Russia's influence on the recent U.S. election, digital voting has long been suspected of being both unreliable and highly vulnerable to tampering. Blockchain technology offers a way of verifying that a voter's vote was successfully sent while retaining their anonymity. It promises not only to reduce fraud in elections, but also to increase general voter turnout as people will be able to vote on their mobile phones. Blockchain technology is still very much in its infancy, and most of the applications are a long way from general use. Even Bitcoin, the most established blockchain platform, is subject to huge volatility, indicative of its relative newcomer status. However, the potential for blockchain to solve some of the major problems we face today makes it an extraordinarily exciting and seductive technology to follow. I will certainly be keeping an eye out. Chapter 3. How Blockchain Technology Can Benefit Many Industries Beyond Finance Blockchain technology is largely associated with the financial sector, but distributed ledger applications have much to offer other industries as well. Deloitte University Press recently released a report titled Beyond Bitcoin, 
Blockchain is coming to disrupt your industry. Examining blockchain's application in different industries. Industries besides the financial sector include media, consumer products, industrial products, automobiles, travel, hospitality, retail, life sciences, healthcare, government, and energy. The report, authored by David Shatsky and Craig Moraskin, reviews the history and workings of blockchain technology. It noted that $1 billion in venture capital has been invested in more than 120 blockchain-related startups, half of which has occurred in a recent 12-month period. Financial sector leads 24-7. Instant spot trading. The current method for spot trading is not instantaneous, even though the idea behind spot trading is for immediate delivery of the traded instrument. It actually takes a day or two to settle the majority of transactions. This is because of the delay associated with using third parties in each transaction, such as brokers. As a result of the involvement of these intermediaries, one cannot currently spot trade on the weekends. The blockchain database can get around this problem by introducing direct trading between clients that doesn't necessitate using third parties to settle the transaction. This means that trade contracts can be settled immediately, reducing settlement costs and providing a highly liquid market at all times, including on the weekends. Another crucial point is that instantaneous trading will almost eliminate counterparty risk. This is the risk that one party in a trade defaults while the transaction is in the process of settlement. It's little wonder that financial institutions are excited about this benefit of blockchain technology. Cheaper banking. Banks are also optimistic about the cost reduction benefits of blockchain technology. A key area of banking that the distributed database will save money on is international payments. In international banking, international payments can take up to four days to settle. The current architecture results in the need for centralized authorities to verify transactions. This verification takes time and it is expensive for banks. With blockchain technology, both parties can reach an agreement on the validity of a transaction without the need for a bureaucratic authority. This agreement would be instantaneous because each bank will have its own copy of the blockchain ledger. The payment could be verified by every computer on the network in less than a few minutes and thus recognized as a valid transaction. Instantaneous international payments would reduce costs for banks enormously and give them a serious boost in terms of efficiency. It's no surprise that some major banks are already looking at ways to implement the blockchain within a few years. Media and telecom uses. Beyond the financial sector, the media and telecommunication industries offer use cases. Media sector applications include supporting low-cost microtransactions that can be processed without the fees that existing payment networks require. A newspaper website, for example, can charge readers per page or per article rather than per month. The blockchain can secure intellectual property and creative digital products like music and images. A blockchain ledger can be a reliable and secure way to prove a work's provenance and attribution. The digital block's programmability makes it possible to enforce usage rights. IBM and Samsung have offered a proof of concept built partly using Ethereum, a blockchain-based framework, to demonstrate how blockchain can support the Internet of Things, IoT, applications, by supporting transaction processing devices. The distributed nature of the ledger can foster coordination among multiple devices. In addition, the cryptographic security that blockchains rely on can reduce the security challenges that IoT deployments face. Verizon Ventures, a division of Verizon Communications, has invested in a startup that has raised $5 million, is exploring blockchain-enabled IoT applications. Orange, a telecom, has also invested in a blockchain startup. Alternative retail payment platforms are the most obvious application in the consumer and industrial product arenas. Other applications are more futuristic. DocuSign, which provides digital transaction management and electronic signature technology, developed an app for Visa's connected car proof of concept. The app integrates with the Bitcoin blockchain and records contracts. The application is designed to simplify auto purchasing and leasing. Travel and hospitality uses. 
For travel and hospitality, a shared distributed ledger can simplify the settlement process. Blockchain technology can support loyalty points programs that include a more advantageous accounting of liabilities created by the accrual of points, real-time updating of points balances, and improved points management across franchised operations. In healthcare and life sciences, blockchain technology can secure digital assets. Factum, a blockchain-based record-keeping service, has partnered with medical procedure billing and ordering services. The partnerships will use blockchain to store healthcare records. The cryptographic security can enhance record security, while the irrevocable and immutable nature of transactions can make claims processing more efficient. Blockchain-secured health records could make it easier for patients to share records with numerous providers while keeping control of the records. Philips Healthcare is exploring applications for blockchain technology, but it has not disclosed the applications it is evaluating. Public Sector Uses The blockchain can improve record-keeping in the public sector. Factum has reportedly partnered with the Honduras government on a blockchain program to record land ownership. The program's goal is to reduce fraud and corruption associated with a government-controlled centralized registry by substituting that system with a transparent distributed ledger. Other public sector uses include vehicle registries, digital identities for individuals, voting records, and benefits disbursements. In the energy sector, a South African company integrated Bitcoin payments into smart utility meter reading to enable customers to prepay utility bills digitally. This system is especially helpful for unbanked customers, and it is easier to administer. Horizontal blockchain applications apply to numerous industries. Such applications include automated audits, smart contracts, and enhanced cybersecurity. Smart contracts, agreements that can automatically activate actions based on specific conditions, could reduce administrative costs by self-enforcing, such as requiring a driver to be current on lease payments in order to start a leased car. Blockchain technology can change the role of corporate audits by allowing a third party to verify a distributed network to ensure the transactions are accurate, complete, and unalterable. Cryptographic signing using blockchain can enable immediate detection of data manipulation and verify IT system integrity, giving blockchain a role in cybersecurity. GuardTime, a company based in Estonia, has explored such a solution. Top 3 Blockchain Ecosystem Segments The report divides the blockchain vendor ecosystem into three categories. 1. Applications and solutions providers include Bitcoin wallet operators and payment providers. 2. Middleware and services include software platforms that allow enterprises to build blockchain applications. Such companies include Factom, Blockcipher, Kolu, and Chain Inc. 3. Infrastructure and protocols players seek to use blockchain technology to create cryptographically secure distributed consensus mechanisms. Examples include Ethereum, an open source crowd-funded project that has become a Bitcoin blockchain alternative. Ripple has also developed its own distributed ledger technology. The infrastructure and protocol segment has secured just under 300 million in venture funding, two-thirds of which occurred in 2015. Investment is shifting toward the middleware and infrastructure providers versus Bitcoin, the report noted. It may be a year or more before significant commercial applications of the technology emerge, but it is increasingly likely that over time, many industries will experience its impact. Chapter 4. The Future of Blockchain Society is transforming at an unprecedented rate, from rewriting the traditional social contract between government and citizens to online retailers waging war against brick-and-mortar stores. These changes are building blocks to a new economic reality. The sharing economy has the potential to bring about renewed trust in the advantages of globalization and to speed up economic development worldwide. For the time being, it's also missing an infrastructure that builds trust and which does not rely on a centralized system. Blockchain, supporting distributed ledger technology, DLT, could grow into that infrastructure and thus enable fast and trusted exchanges in a decentralized network. 
Businesses and governments alike are currently investigating the potential of blockchain. It will be critical that they maintain a holistic view of the risks and opportunities that DLT technology holds beyond their specific industry, supply chain, or regulatory focus. My blockchain, your blockchain. A highly versatile technology, blockchain can be designed to match the exact requirements of its users. At the same time, it is important to understand the trade-offs and limitations of deploying the technology, particularly at scale. Blockchain should not be considered as a single technology solution that can solve all problems. In a report released earlier this year, Data61, the CSIRO's research lab, examined the risks and opportunities for three use cases for blockchains, being supply chain, open registry, and payment systems. In the report, Data61 highlighted a number of the currently known limitations to blockchain implementations. For example, it noted that current blockchain systems such as Bitcoin cannot match the maximum throughput of conventional transaction processing systems, which raises the issue of scalability. Similarly, the fact that all data on the blockchain is publicly readable and immutable raises potential issues about confidentiality and the ability to erase information. The report also noted that some of these limitations, such as scalability, are the subject of research and developments which may be addressed in the future, but some of the limitations are an inherent property of blockchains. Interaction with the law. Versatility is one of the blockchain's key advantages. The technology can be adapted to most sectors of activity and to a large share of processes that do not involve sensitive information or require human oversight. Most industries have jumped on the blockchain development bandwagon, and according to independent sources, banks are expected to quintuple their investment in the technology over the next two years. The technology is bringing together finance and insurance companies, while other sectors such as healthcare and agriculture are also investigating the technology's capabilities. At this time, interest in potential blockchain applications includes enabling payments and financial transactions, actioning smart contracts, and managing complex supply chains. While blockchain can support a decentralized and trusted open database with immutable transactions, there are several legal risk areas which private business should take into account. Privacy and confidentiality. At its core, blockchain is a distributed database that allows any participating node to retrieve and verify its content. All data in this database is accessible to any participating node. While data stored on the blockchain can be, and generally is, stored, encrypted, or in a de-identified way, for example, a Bitcoin address consists of nothing more than a string of random-looking alphanumeric characters, the transactions on the blockchain are readable so that participating nodes can process and verify the transactions. For example, a processing node will be able to determine that address A sent five bitcoins to address B at a particular time, but will not be able to tell the identity of the person in control of address A and address B. While de-identification is a useful means to protect privacy, the risk of re-identification through data matching will need to be considered especially over the long term. For example, if the owner of address A is identified at any time, then all Bitcoin transactions made by that address A will be associated with that person. In Bitcoin, this privacy risk can be addressed by the user not reusing any Bitcoin addresses. Another way to address the privacy risk is to operate a permission blockchain that only permits trusted entities to process and therefore view the blockchain. Huge potential. In business today, we still require trusted administrators to manage and record the numbers and databases, auditors, supervisory boards, and so on. The potential of blockchain is that it offers the chance to distribute these digital ledgers to others through a network of computers across the world. It could actually dispense with those businesses that are based on trusted relationships, such as banking, auditing, solicitors, even aspects of government. For example, in Sweden, Georgia, and Ukraine, property registers are being moved on to the blockchain. In finance, people rarely lend directly to each other, 
Hence the need for banks as trusted go-betweens. The beauty of cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin or Ethereum is that they remove the need for the trusted third party using instead an encrypted secure database. This has huge implications for any business that requires the verification of payments and performance of contracts. That is, most businesses. The beauty of blockchain is that something can be unique and stored digitally with ease without needing an equivalent in the real world. For example, things like contracts, wills, deeds, and share certificates might only require a piece of code stored on the blockchain that represents the exchange. Instead of a trusted intermediary verifying transactions, the computers of the shared network of Bitcoin users themselves perform the verification at no cost to those involved in the transaction. Lack of identity and verification. In conventional transactions, trust between the parties is generally established through identity verification. Similarly, identity verification is a core aspect of the know your client requirement that applies to many businesses and transactions. Blockchain implementations are naturally geared towards enabling automated processes where the identity of the underlying actors are not relevant or automatically masqueraded. While identity can be verified separately and linked to the on-chain data, this creates privacy risks as described above. Permanency and irreversibility. By its nature, a blockchain is an ever-growing sequential chain of chronological transactions that are linked to the rules implemented that are linked to the rules implemented in that blockchain. For example, reversing an incorrect transaction on a blockchain requires a new transaction which must which must generally be initiated by the relevant user given the decentralized nature of blockchain to reverse the economic effect of the old transaction rather than deleting the old transaction. While this permanency is beneficial in many use cases, it may not be appropriate for certain use cases. For example, in the case of a fraudulent transaction involving a blockchain-based asset registry, or Bitcoin, the court may order the reversal of the transaction. But the lack of central control means that the enforcement of that order is difficult if the fraudulent actor cannot be found or compelled to initiate the reverse transaction. At present, such issue can be addressed by creating a fork of the blockchain, but that requires consensus of the community and may result in a fractured community. Developments are also being made to develop blockchains that can be edited in certain circumstances, but such a model requires a central administrator, which removes the benefits of a fully decentralized model. Enforceability and relative trust. This verification process holds the seeds of change across huge numbers of industries. The distributed ledger, the blockchain, offers the chance to enhance truth and trust in every system to which it is applied. It can prove who owns what at any given moment. Anything that currently exists to verify contracts, ownership, payments, and even performance can be shifted to the blockchain. This would transfer power away from those who currently manage or verify transactions, a seismic change to the way the world currently operates. As with any power shift, those holding power are reluctant to surrender it. The winners in this scenario will come from existing companies rather than startups, given that for this new system to work, it requires buy-in and trust. Existing brands already have this advantage. So what are blockchain's main advantages? By performing the functions of record keepers and managers, it would enhance decentralization, reduce the number of intermediaries involved, and provide an alternative to how value can be stored. Physical as well as digital assets could be uniquely verified online to prove ownership. As transactions stored on the blockchain could be independently verified and traced, it would be easier to fight crime, counterfeiting, and fraud, reducing systemic risk in the financial system. A distributed digital ledger would make it near impossible to change or falsify data because data would have to be altered across all the related blocks in the digital chain. So any tampering would be exposed. Consequently, associated costs would fall, enhancing economic growth and prosperity. 
A dramatic disruption is happening already in the financial industry. The world's largest custodian bank, BNY Mellon, is using a blockchain-based platform for government bond settlement. And one of the Bank of England's research focus areas is based on financial technology, or fintech, and how it affects the way markets and society function. Another benefit would be to make micropayments possible digitally. A country such as India, where a huge number of people still do not have access to banking, could experience profound economic change if brought within their reach, helping them save, borrow, and plan for their future. Intellectual property. While cost-effective in the long run, blockchain requires high capital investment in the early stages. Organizations engaging in platform design should protect resulting IP sooner rather than later in the process to avoid issues. However, protection of software IP in the context of blockchain has its own challenges, as participants of the blockchain will likely demand a full copy of the source code and its implementation to satisfy itself that the implementation is sound and reflects the intended operational rules. Many blockchain technologies are also either based on open source software or released as open source software, which further limits the ability to claim exclusive IP protection. International regulation. While legislatures will unlikely regulate blockchain as a technology itself, the implementation of blockchain in particular use cases may be the subject of additional regulatory scrutiny, for example, within the financial or health sectors. At this time, we are not aware of any regulations that govern particular blockchain implementation, including Bitcoin, which has received a fair degree of regulatory scrutiny in the context of how it sits within existing regulatory frameworks. However, we estimate that with rapid technological development, there will come a regulatory change that companies should prepare for. On the public record, public institutions are equally involved in the race to develop blockchain applications. In some cases, national government branches are trialing the use of blockchain to simplify record-keeping and enhance efficiency, such as the projects developed by Sweden, Brazil, and Georgia for centralized land registries. In Australia, while the federal government commissioned the CSIRO's research arm, Data61, to conduct a study into the opportunities and risks presented by blockchain technology, the Victorian government is taking things a step further by investigating the potential of the technology through its participation in the Australian Digital Currency and Commerce Association. Taking into account the joint focus of public institutions and private businesses on developing blockchain solutions in the near future, the idea of public-private partnerships has great potential. Many issues could benefit from such partnerships, amongst them food safety, welfare benefit management, and health care. An excellent example of a joint initiative involving blockchain is the ID2020 project driven by the UN in partnership with Accenture and Microsoft. The platform in question would be designed to support the creation and documentation of legal identification to over one billion people living without official documents worldwide, which is critical to them accessing a broad range of basic services, including education and health care. Dialogue between stakeholders in the public arena and private business can only accelerate innovation and safeguard from potential risks including non-compliance with evolving regulation and unilateral development of systems rather than co-design of shared platforms. Through a global lens, the sharing economy has proven its ability to connect French bakers to American foodies and Australian globetrotters to Peruvian homeowners. If developed with global standards in mind, blockchain has the potential to deliver faster, and improve services to citizens and consumers across the globe. To prove this claim, China is currently conducting a multi-pronged effort. A variety of state-owned enterprises, including the People's Bank of China and the ICBC, and privately owned companies, including online retailer Alibaba and tourism giant Wanda, are racing to develop blockchain applications within their respective industries. While the results of the blockchain race are yet uncertain, 
The technology has a clear potential to redesign the way interaction between states, businesses, and individuals occur across the globe. Smart risk management and a holistic view of operational exposures, legal and regulatory issues, and strategic risks will be key to blockchain delivering measurable value in the future. Chapter 5. Blockchain and Finance Industry The basic rules of the game for creating and capturing economic value were once fixed in place. For years or even decades, companies pursued the same old business models, usually selling goods or services, building and renting assets and land, and offering people's time as services, and tried to execute better than their competitors did. But now, business model disruption is changing the very nature of economic returns and industry definitions. All industries are seeing rapid displacement, disruption, and in extreme cases, outright destruction. The financial services industry, with its large commercial and investment banks and money managers, is no exception. Silicon Valley is coming, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon warned in his annual letter to shareholders. He said startups are coming for Wall Street, innovating and creating efficiency in areas that are important to companies, such as J.P. Morgan, particularly in the lending and payment space. The payment startup, Stripe, has a multi-billion dollar valuation and a partnership with Apple Pay. Bitcoin companies and exchanges, such as 21 and Coinbase, are attracting tens of millions of dollars from venture capitalists. Peer-to-peer -peer lending is booming in the small loan market with many players, including Upstart, Prosper, Funding Circle, and more. And the financial planning startup LearnVest just got acquired for more than $250 million. Many of these organizations are in the lending business, but are using big data and cloud technologies rather than tellers and branches to speed lending and customer acquisition. Others are leveraging network business models, such as peer-to-peer -peer lending, to bring together would-be lenders and borrowers. According to Diamond, we are going to work hard to make our services as seamless and competitive as theirs. His underlying thought is this. If his company doesn't keep pace with today's well-capitalized upstarts, they will begin to lose relevance in a platform-centric world. In lots of areas, it looks like the blockchain will replace the current centralized business model of the financial services industry. There are many innovative network business models that are coming after traditional financial services and banking organizations. And big banks are beginning to realize they must evolve in response if they want to remain viable in a digitally centric world whether it comes by acquiring, partnering, or developing leading-edge technologies. But what's less clear is why, exactly, these new entrants are so disruptive and powerful. What enables them to skirt perceived constraints of these once too large to fail incumbents and exploit unseen possibilities? In short, it is network-centered thinking with platform-based business models. Control shifting away from central banks. In London's Canary Wharf, a team of technologists and executives are trying to understand how to use blockchain technology to change the future of banking globally. Their leader is Blythe Masters, an ex-Wall Street commodities trader turned digital entrepreneur, focused on turning the mental model and business model of the massive financial services industry and all its related parties, consumers, lawyers, accountants, on its head. Bank executives worldwide are trying to figure out what this evolution in technology will mean for their firms. We could go the way that file transfer technology changed music, allowing new businesses like iTunes to emerge. That is why there is such feverish activity at the moment, said Michael Hart, Chief Operations and Technical Officer at Barclays, according to a recent article in the Financial Times. For the massive financial services sector, Blockchain technology, the software behind the digital currency Bitcoin, offers an opportunity to overhaul its existing business model, including its banking infrastructure, approach to settlements, and customer interactions. But acting on this opportunity and making the most of the blockchain is no easy task 
given the core beliefs and reinforcing systems that are embedded in the industry. Networks are taking over. What is the blockchain? It is a distributed database of computers that maintain records and manages transactions. Rather than having a central authority, such as a bank, blockchain uses the network to approve blocks or transactions, which are then added to the chain of computer code. Cryptography is used to keep transactions secure, and the distributed nature of transaction approval makes the system harder to tamper with. It is only a matter of time before the broad financial services and banking industries shift to blockchain and network-based approaches. Blockchain technology has been hailed by its VC supporters as having revolutionary promise for all involved. You should be taking this technology as seriously as you should have been taking the development of the Internet in the early 1990s. It's analogous to email for money, said Masters, according to the Financial Times. And blockchain enthusiasts believe that the application possibilities are endless, improving the way we hold and transfer secure goods from money to deeds to music to intellectual property. In fact, blockchain, as a pure platform technology, may be able to cut out the middlemen or middle companies everywhere, even disrupting other disruptors like Airbnb or Uber. In the present financial services business model, a central ledger most often acts as the custodian of that information, such as the Federal Reserve and its member banks. But in a blockchain world, the information regarding each transaction is transparently held in a digitally shared database in the cloud, without a single central body acting as the middleman. This lack of central authority is the very feature that is turning the current mental and business models of traditional financial institutions on their heads. In a lot of areas, it looks like the blockchain will replace the current centralized business model of the financial services industry, and it is easy to see how it could revolutionize all of Wall Street. The ability of the technology to provide an unforgeable record of identity, including the history of an individual's transactions, is one area being eagerly explored. David Grace, head of global finance at PwC, said that if you have a secure distributed ledger, it could be used to store validated know-your-customer data on individuals or companies. It's a potentially global application that could provide more security over identity data and where that data are stored. It seems that the code can perform better than a real middleman in most cases. Clearly, we are entering a period of rapid evolution as the financial services industry determines blockchain and what it means for their business models. Or another scenario, a slew of startups identifies the possibilities and pulls the rug from under big institutions. Traditional perceptions about the roles of financial players are already under attack as it seems that the code can perform better than a real middleman in most cases. Old business models will soon fall prey to the quickly evolving technology and mental models. The network is about to do its magic, grow and evolve without central control. Network business models will dominate. The blockchain is already seeing use outside of the financial services sector where it got its start. Technology and services giant IBM is adapting the blockchain methodology to develop a currency-less system that could be used for any purpose. For example, executing contracts upon delivery. Arvind Krishna, senior vice president of IBM Research, believes that in the long run, this technology could facilitate transactions between banks or international businesses. I want to extend banking to the 3.2 billion people who are going to come into the middle class over the next 15 years, he said. So I need a much lower cost of keeping a ledger. Blockchain offers some intriguing possibilities there. A firm-centered or centrally controlled banking system clearly will not get him there, and the blockchain will allow him to leverage a digitally enabled network as the way forward. Join the network revolution. With companies such as IBM and J.P. Morgan Chase, as well as preeminent venture capitalist firm Andreessen Horowitz, backing this new way of facilitating financial transactions, 
It is only a matter of time before the broader financial services and banking industries shift to blockchain and network-based approaches to complement or replace the current centralized approach. The question is not whether network business models supported by blockchain technology will disrupt these organizations, but when. So if you are a member of the current financial services industry elite or a local bank or credit union, it's time to become part of the digital revolution and join the network and platform emerging world. Chapter 6. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a virtual currency. It doesn't exist in the kind of physical form that the currency and coin were used to exist in. It doesn't even exist in a form as physical as monopoly money. It's electrons, not molecules. But consider how much cash you personally handle. You get a paycheck that you take to the bank, or it's auto-deposited without you even seeing the paper that it's not printed on. You then use a debit card or a checkbook, if you're old school, to access those funds. At best, you see 10% of it in cash form in your pocket or in your pocketbook. So it turns out that 90% of the funds that you manage are virtual, electrons in a spreadsheet or database. But wait, those are U.S. funds, or those of whatever country you hail from, safe in the bank and guaranteed by the full faith of the FDIC, up to about $250,000 per account, right? Well, not exactly. Your financial institution may only require to keep 10% of its deposits on deposit. In some cases, it's less. It lends the rest of your money out to other people for up to 30 years. It charges them for the loan and charges you for the privilege of letting them lend it out. How does money get created? Your bank gets to create money by lending it out. Say you deposit $1,000 with your bank. They then lend out $900 of it. Suddenly, you have $1,000 and someone else has $900. Magically, there's $1,900 floating around where before there was only a grand. Now say your bank instead lends 900 of your dollars to another bank. That bank in turn lends $810 to another bank, which then lends $720 to a customer. Poof! $3,430 in an instant. Almost $2,500 created out of nothing, as long as the bank follows your government's central bank rules. Creation of Bitcoin is as different from bank funds creation as cash is from electrons. It is not controlled by a government's central bank, but rather by consensus of its users and nodes. It is not created by a limited mint in a building, but rather by distributed open source software and computing. And it requires a form of actual work for creation. More on that shortly. Who invented Bitcoin? The first Bitcoins were in a block of 50, the Genesis block, created by Satoshi Nakamoto in January 2009. It didn't really have any value at first. It was just a cryptographer's plaything, based on a paper published two months earlier by Nakamoto. Nakamoto is an apparently fictional name. No one seems to know who he, or she, or they is or are. Who keeps track of it all? Once the Genesis block was created, Bitcoins have since been generated by doing the work of keeping track of all transactions for all Bitcoins as a kind of public ledger. The nodes, computers, doing the calculations on the ledger, are rewarded for doing so. For each set of successful calculations, the node is rewarded with a certain amount of Bitcoin, BTC, which are then newly generated into the Bitcoin ecosystem, hence the term Bitcoin miner, because the process creates new BTC. As the supply of BTC increases, and as the number of transactions increases, the work necessary to update the public ledger gets harder and more complex. As a result, the number of new BTC into the system is designed to be about 50 BTC, one block, every 10 minutes worldwide. Even though the computing power for mining Bitcoin and for updating the public ledger is currently increasing exponentially, so is the complexity of the math problem, which incidentally also requires a certain amount of guessing or proof needed to mine Bitcoin and to settle the transactional books at any given moment. So the system still only generates one 50 BTC block every 10 minutes or 2,106 blocks every two weeks. So in a sense, 
Everyone keeps track of it. That is, all the nodes in the network keep track of the history of every single Bitcoin. How much is there and where is it? There is a maximum number of Bitcoin that can ever be generated, and that number is 21 million. According to the Khan Academy, the number is expected to top out around the year 2140. As of this morning, there were 12.1 million BTC in circulation. Your own Bitcoin are kept in a file, your Bitcoin wallet, in your own storage, your computer. The file itself is proof of the number of BTC you have, and it can move with you on a mobile device. If that file, with the cryptographic key in your wallet, gets lost, so does your supply of Bitcoin funds, and you can't get it back. How much is it worth? The value varies based on how much people think it's worth, just like in the exchange of real money. But because there is no central authority trying to keep the value around a certain level, it can vary more dynamically. The first BTC were basically worth nothing at the time, but those BTC still exist. As of 11 a.m. on December 11, 2013, the public value was $906 U.S. per Bitcoin. When I finished writing this sentence, it was $900. Around the beginning of 2013, the value was around $20 U.S. On November 27, 2013, it was valued at more than $1,000 U.S. per BTC. So it's kind of volatile at the moment, but it's expected to settle down. The total value of all Bitcoin as of the period at the end of this sentence is around 11 billion U.S. dollars. How can I spend it? There are hundreds of merchants of all sizes that take Bitcoin in payment, from cafes to auto dealerships. There's even a Bitcoin ATM in Vancouver, British Columbia, for converting your BTC to cash in Vancouver, B.C. Money has had a long history, millennia in length. Somewhat recent legend tells us that Manhattan Island was bought for wampum, seashells and the like. In the early years of the United States, different banks printed their own currency. On a recent visit to Salt Spring Island in British Columbia, I spent currency that was only good on the lovely island. The common theme amongst these was a trust agreement amongst its users that that particular currency held value. Sometimes that value was tied directly to something solid and physical like gold. In 1900, the U.S. tied its currency directly to gold, the gold standard, and in 1971 ended that tie. Now, currency is traded like any other commodity, although a particular country's currency value can be propped up or diminished through actions of their central bank. Bitcoin is an alternate currency that is also traded, and its value, like that of other commodities, is determined through trade, but is not held up or diminished by the action of any bank, but rather directly by the actions of its users. Its supply is limited and known, however, and unlike physical currency, so is the history of every single Bitcoin. Its perceived value, like all other currency, is based on its utility and trust. As a form of currency, Bitcoin is not exactly a new thing in creation, but it certainly is a new way for money to be created. Chapter 7. Bitcoin Mastery The best way to learn about Bitcoin is to jump in and get a few in your pocket to get a feel for how they work. Despite the hype about how difficult and dangerous it can be, getting Bitcoins is a lot easier and safer than you might think. In a lot of ways, it is probably easier than opening an account at a traditional bank. And, given what has been happening in the banking system, it is probably safer, too. There are a few things to learn. Getting and using a software wallet. Learning how to spend and receive money. Learning how to buy Bitcoin from a person or an exchange. Preparation. Before getting started, you will need to get yourself a wallet. You can do this easily enough by registering with one of the exchanges which will host the wallet for you. And although I think you're going to want to have one or more exchange wallets eventually, you should start with one on your computer, both to get a better feel for Bitcoin and because the exchanges are still experimental themselves. When we get to that stage of the discussion, I will be advising that you get in the habit of moving your money and coins off the exchanges or diversifying across exchanges to keep your money safe. What is a wallet? It is a way to store your Bitcoin, specifically 
It is software that has been designed to store Bitcoin. It can be run on your desktop computer, laptop, mobile device, except as yet Apple, and can also be made to store Bitcoins on things like thumb drives. If you are concerned about being hacked, then that is a good option. Even the Winklevoss twins, who have millions invested in Bitcoin, put their investment on hard drives, which they then put into a safety deposit box. The Winklevoss twins are the ones who originally had the idea for a social marketing site that became Facebook. They hired Mark Zuckerberg, who took their idea as his own and became immensely rich. What do you need to know about having a Bitcoin wallet on your computer? Below, you can download the original Bitcoin wallet or client in Windows or Mac format. These are not just wallets, but are in fact part of the Bitcoin network. They will receive, store, and send your Bitcoins. You can create one or more addresses with a click. An address is a number that looks like this. One, capital L, Y, capital F, C, capital Q, A, T, B, G, four, capital B, V, capital T, nine, G, capital G, T, Z, six, capital V, D, Q, Q, capital H, K, P, capital P, N, five, capital Q, B, U, K. You will see a field where you can copy and paste a number like this from a person you want to send money to, and off it will go directly into that person's wallet. You can even create a QR code, which will let someone take a picture with an app on their phone and send you some Bitcoin. It is perfectly safe to give these out. Note: This type of wallet acts both as a wallet for you and as a part of the Bitcoin system. The reason Bitcoin works is that every transaction is broadcast and recorded as a number across the entire system, meaning that every transaction is confirmed and made irreversible by the network itself. Any computer with the right software can be a part of that system, checking and supporting the network. This wallet serves as your personal wallet and also as a support for that system. Therefore, be aware that it will take up to eight to nine gigabytes of your computer's memory. After you install the wallet, it will take as much as a day for the wallet to sync with the network. This is normal, does not harm your computer, and makes the system as a whole more secure. So it's a good idea. Bitcoin QT. This is a full-featured wallet. Create multiple addresses to receive bitcoins, send bitcoins easily, track transactions, and back up your wallet. Outside of the time it takes to sync, this is a very easy to use option. Search for Bitcoin QT Wallet Download to find their site. Armory, the original wallet, runs on top of Bitcoin QT, so it has all of the same syncing requirements. Armory allows you to back up, encrypt, and the ability to store your Bitcoins offline. Search for Bitcoin Armory Wallet to find their site. If you don't want to have that much money used or don't want to wait for your wallet to sync, there are good wallets that do not make you sync the entire history of Bitcoin. Multibit, a lightweight wallet that syncs quickly. This is very good for new users. Search for Bitcoin Multibit Wallet to find their site. Electum, in addition to being quick and light, this wallet allows you to recover lost data using a passcode. Search for Bitcoin Electum Wallet to find their site. After you get the wallet set up, take a few minutes clicking around. Things to look for. There will be a page that shows you how many Bitcoins are currently in your wallet. Keep in mind that Bitcoins can be broken up into smaller pieces, so you may see a decimal with lots of zeros after it. Interesting note, 0.0000000001 is one Satoshi, named after the pseudonymous creator of Bitcoin. There will be an area showing what your recent transactions are. There will be an area where you can create an address and a QR code. You don't need the QR code if you don't want it. But if you run a business and you want to accept Bitcoin, then all you need to do to accept payment is to show someone the QR code. Let them take a picture of it, and they will be able to send you some money. You'll also be able to create as many addresses as you like. So if you want to track where the money is coming from, you could have a separately labeled address from each one of your payees. There will be an area with a box for you to paste a code when you want to send money to someone or to yourself on an exchange or a different wallet. There will be other options and features, but to start out, these are the items that you should know about. Getting your first Bitcoins. Now that you have a wallet, you will, of course, want to test them out. 
The very first place to go is http colon slash slash faucet dot bitcoin dot st. This is a website that gives out small amounts of Bitcoin for the purpose of getting people used to using them. The original version of this was run by the lead developer of Bitcoin, Gavin Andreessen. That site is since closed, and this site operates by sending out one or two advertisements a month. You agree to receive those messages by requesting the Bitcoins. Copy and paste your new Bitcoin address and enter a phone number to which you can receive an SMS. They send out an SMS to be sure that people are not continuously coming back for more, since it costs nothing to create a Bitcoin address. They will also send out once or twice a month advertisements to support their operation. The amount they send is trivial: 0.0015 BTC or 1.5 M BTC. However, they process almost immediately, and you can check to see that your address and wallet are working. It is also quite a feeling. To get that portion of a Bitcoin, non-disclaimer: I have no connection with this site and receive nothing if you use them. I simply think they're a good way to get your feet wet. Congratulations, you have just entered the Bitcoin economy. To get your feet a little wetter, you can go panning for gold. There are a number of services and websites out there that will pay you in Bitcoin to do things like go to certain websites, fill out online surveys, or watch sponsored videos. These are harmless, and you can earn a few extra bitcoins this way. But it is important to remember that these are businesses that get paid when people click on the links on their sites. They are essentially kicking back a portion of what they get paid to you. There's nothing illegal or even immoral about this. You might like what you see and make a purchase, but they are frequently flashy and may not be completely straightforward. All the ones that I've tried, particularly Bitvisitor.com, have paid out as advertised. It's interesting to experiment with these, but even with the likely rise in the value of Bitcoin, you won't become a millionaire doing this. So, unless you're an advertisement junkie, I would recommend you move on. If you would like to try, simply Google "free bitcoins" or something along those lines, and you will find numerous sites buying Bitcoin hand to hand. Finally, this is going to be the real test of Bitcoin: can people easily trade them back and forth? If this can't happen, then there can't really be a Bitcoin economy, because retailers won't be able to use it. If retailers can't use it, what earthly good is it? Fortunately, this is not really a problem. iPhone is a bit of a holdout, but many smartphones have apps, mobile wallets, that will read QR codes and allow you to send Bitcoin to whomever you want. You can also display a QR code of your address. Or even carry a card in your wallet with your QR code to let people send Bitcoin to you. Depending on what kind of wallet you have, you can then check to see if the Bitcoins have been received. A couple of things to note: when you set up your wallet, if you click around a bit, you will see an option to pay a fee to speed transactions. This money becomes available to a Bitcoin miner as he, she, or they process Bitcoin information. The miner is doing the work of creating blocks of information. Keeps the system up to date and secure. The fee is an incentive to the miner to be sure to include your information in the next information block and therefore verify it. In the short term, miners are making most of their money by mining new coins. Check the section on what are bitcoins for more information about this. In the long term, as it gets harder to find new coins and as the economy increases. The fees will be an incentive for miners to keep creating more blocks and keep the economy going. Your wallet should be set to pay zero fees as a default, but if you want, you can add a fee to prioritize your transactions. You are under no obligation to pay a fee, and many organizations that process many small transactions, like the ones that Pan for Gold described above, produce enough fees to keep the miners happy. In clicking around your wallet on the transactions page or link to specific transactions, you will see a note about confirmations. When you make a transaction, that information is sent out into the network, and the network will send back a confirmation that there is no double entry for that Bitcoin. It is smart to wait until you get several confirmations before walking away from someone who has paid you. It is actually not very easy to scam someone hand to hand like this, and it is not very cost effective for the criminal. But it can be done. Where can you buy Bitcoin like this? 
you may have a Bitcoin meetup in your area. You can check out localbitcoins.com to find people near you who are interested in buying or selling. Some are trying to start up local street exchanges across the world. These are called Buttonwoods, after the first street exchange established on Wall Street in 1792 under a Buttonwood tree. See if there is one or start one in your area. See if you have any friends who would like to try Bitcoins out. Actually, the more people who start using Bitcoin, the larger and more successful it will become. So please tell two friends. Some people ask if it is possible to buy physical Bitcoins. The answer to this is both a yes and a no. Bitcoin, by its very nature, is a digital currency and has no physical form. However, there are a couple of ways that you can practically hold a Bitcoin in your hands. Kaskaskia's Coins. These are the brainchild of Mike Caldwell. He mints physical coins and then embeds the private keys for the Bitcoins inside them. You can get the private key by peeling a hologram from the coin, which will then clearly show that the coin has been tampered with. Mike has gone out of his way to ensure that he can be trusted. These are a good investment strategy, as in the years to come, it may be that these coins are huge collector's items. Paper Wallets A paper wallet just means that rather than keeping the information for your Bitcoin stored in a digital wallet, you print the key information off along with a private key and keep it safe in a safe, in a drawer, or in your mattress if you like. This is a highly recommended and cost-effective system for keeping your Bitcoin safe. Keep in mind, though, that someone could steal them, or if your house burns, they will go with the house, and there will be no way to get them back. Really, no different than cash. Also, as with Kaskaskia's coins, they will not really be good for spending until you put them back into the computer. There is software to make printing your paper wallets easier. BitcoinPaperWallet.com is one of the best and includes a good tutorial about how to use them. The Bitcoins are not actually in the wallet. They are still on the web. In fact, the outside of the wallet will have a QR code that will allow you to ship coins to the wallet anytime you like. The sealed part of the wallet will have the private key without which you cannot access the coins. Therefore, only put as many coins on the wallet as you want to be inaccessible. You will not be able to whip this thing out and take out a few coins to buy a cup of coffee. Rather, think of it as a piggy bank. To get the money, you have to smash it. It is possible to take out smaller amounts, but at this point, the security of the wallet is compromised, and it would be easier for someone to steal the coins. Better to have them all in or out. People who use paper wallets are usually security conscious, and there are a number of ways for the nefarious in the world to hack your computer. BitcoinPaperWallet.com gives a lot of good advice about how to print your wallet securely. Some people have also asked about buying Bitcoins on eBay. Yes, it is possible, but they will be far overpriced. So selling on eBay might seem to be a better option, given the extreme markup over market value you might see. But as with anything that is too good to be true, this is too good to be true. As I will explain in the next section, selling Bitcoin this way is just way too risky. How not to buy Bitcoin. In the next section, I'm going to explain a couple of key points about buying from Bitcoin exchanges. Before I do, let me give you a warning, a short history lesson. When people first started setting up an actual business based on Bitcoin, they used all of the tools available to any merchant. They sold by credit card and PayPal. The problem with this business model was quickly spotted. Bitcoin transactions are not reversible by anyone except the recipient of the money. Credit cards and PayPal have strong buyer protection policies that make it relatively easy for people to request a chargeback. So nefarious individuals realized this and began making purchases of Bitcoin and then sooner or later requesting a chargeback. And since Bitcoin is a non-physical product sent by new and poorly understood technological means, the sellers were not able to contest this. Because of this, Sellers stopped accepting credit cards and PayPal. This was a big problem for the currency. How to move money between buyers and seller. Some business emerged that would credit you with Bitcoin if you wired the money. 
Very often, these businesses would give addresses in Albania, Poland, or Russia. The fact is that many of these did work, and there are a lot of stories on the forums of people who bought bitcoins this way. But it took a lot of time, and in the meantime, the buyer just had to bite his or her fingernails, wondering if they would get their bitcoins or kiss their investment goodbye. I expect that as Bitcoin becomes more acceptable and valuable, we're going to see a version of the Nigerian Prince scam. So the warning is this. We now have exchanges and other businesses that allow for moving money easily onto and off of exchanges. Never wire money for Bitcoin. It was a short-lived and well-forgotten moment in the history of Bitcoin. Chapter 8 Bitcoin Mining Before we begin, before you read further, please understand that most Bitcoin users don't mine. But if you do, then this Bitcoin miner is probably the best deal. Bitcoin mining for profit is very competitive, and volatility in the Bitcoin price makes it difficult to realize monetary gains without also speculating on the price. Mining makes sense if you plan to do it for fun to learn or to support the security of Bitcoin, and do not care if you make a profit. If you have access to large amounts of cheap electricity and the ability to manage a large installation and business, you can mine for a profit. If you want to get Bitcoins based on a fixed amount of mining power, but you don't want to run the actual hardware yourself, you can purchase a mining contract. Another tool many people like to buy is a Bitcoin debit card which enables people to load a debit card with funds via bitcoins. What is Bitcoin mining? Bitcoin mining is a lot like a giant lottery, where you compete with your mining hardware with everyone on the network to earn bitcoins. Faster Bitcoin mining hardware is able to attempt more tries per second to win this lottery, while the Bitcoin network itself adjusts roughly every two weeks to keep the rate of finding a winning block hash to every 10 minutes. In the big picture, Bitcoin mining secures transactions that are recorded in Bitcoin's public ledger, the blockchain. By conducting a random lottery where electricity and specialized equipment are the price of admission, the cost to disrupt the Bitcoin network scales with the amount of hashing power that is being sent by all mining participants. Technical background. During mining, your Bitcoin mining hardware runs a cryptographic hashing function two rounds of SHA-256 on what is called a block header. For each new hash that is tried, the mining software will use a different number as the random element of the block header. This number is called the nonce. Depending on the nonce and what else is in the block, the hashing function will yield a hash which looks something like this. 93EF6F358FBB998C6080 249-686-305-2290-D4C-63735-B7-FE5-BDAAC821-DE96A53A9A. You can look at this hash as a really long number. It's a hexadecimal number, meaning the letters A through F are the digits 10 through 15. To ensure that blocks are found roughly every 10 minutes, there is what's called a difficulty target. To create a valid block, your miner has to find a hash that is below the difficulty target. So if, for example, the difficulty target is 1, followed by a whole lot of zeros, any number that starts with a zero would be below the target. For example, the 0787A6FD, and on and on and on. If we lower the target to 0, 1, and then a whole lot of zeros, we now need two zeros in the beginning to be under it. 0, 0, db 279 you get the idea. Because the target is such an unwieldy number with tons of digits, people generally use a simpler number to express the current target. This number is called the mining difficulty. The mining difficulty expresses how much harder the current block is to generate compared to the first block. So a difficulty of 70,000 means to generate the current block, you have to do 70,000 times more work than Satoshi Nakamoto had to do generating the first block. To be fair, back then mining hardware and algorithms were a lot slower and less optimized. 
To keep blocks coming roughly every 10 minutes, the difficulty is adjusted using a shared formula every 2016 blocks. The network tries to change it such that 2016 blocks at the current global network processing power takes about 14 days. That's why when the network power rises, the difficulty rises as well. Bitcoin Mining Hardware CPU Mining with a CPU was the only way to mine bitcoins and was done using the original Satoshi client. In the quest to further secure the network and earn more bitcoins, miners innovated on many fronts and for years now, CPU mining has been relatively futile. You might mine for decades using your laptop without earning a single coin. GPU. About a year and a half after the network started, it was discovered that high-end graphics cards were much more efficient at Bitcoin mining and the landscape changed. CPU Bitcoin mining gave way to the GPU graphical processing unit. The massively parallel nature of some GPUs allowing for a 50 times to a 100 times increase in Bitcoin mining power while using far less power per unit of work. While any modern GPU can be used to mine, the AMD line of GPU architecture turned out to be far superior to the NVIDIA architecture for mining Bitcoins, and the ATI Radeon HD5870 turned out to be the most cost-effective choice at the time. FPGA As with the CPU to GPU transition, the Bitcoin mining world progressed up the technology food chain to the Field Programmable Gate Array. With the successful launch of the Butterfly Labs FPGA single, the Bitcoin mining hardware landscape gave way to specifically manufactured hardware dedicated to mining Bitcoins. While the FPGAs didn't enjoy a 50x to 100x increase in mining speed, as was seen with the transition from CPUs to GPUs, they provided a benefit through power efficiency and ease of use. A typical 600 MHS graphics card consumed upwards of 400 watts of power, whereas a typical FPGA mining device would provide a hash rate of 826 MHS at 80 watts of power. That 5x improvement allowed the first large Bitcoin mining farms to be constructed at an operational profit. The Bitcoin mining industry was born. ASIC The Bitcoin mining world is now solidly in the application-specific integrated circuit ASIC era. An ASIC is a chip designed specifically to do one thing and one thing only. Unlike FPGAs, an ASIC cannot be repurposed to perform other tasks. An ASIC designed to mine bitcoins can only mine bitcoins and will only ever mine bitcoins. The inflexibility of an ASIC is offset by the fact that it offers a 100x increase in hashing power while reducing power consumption compared to all the previous technologies. Unlike all the previous generations of hardware preceding ASIC, ASIC may be the end of the line when it comes to disruptive mining technology. CPUs were replaced by GPUs, which were in turn replaced by FPGAs, which were replaced by ASICs. There's nothing to replace ASICs now or even in the immediate future. There will be a stepwise refinement of the ASIC products and increases in efficiency, but nothing will offer the 50x to 100x increase in hashing power or 7x reduction in power usage that moves from previous technologies offered. This makes power consumption on an ASIC device the single most important factor of any ASIC product, as the expected useful lifetime of an ASIC mining device is longer than the entire history of Bitcoin mining. It is conceivable that an ASIC device purchased today would still be mining in two years if the device is power efficient enough and the cost of electricity does not exceed its output. Mining profitability is also dictated by the exchange rate, but under all circumstances, the more power efficient the mining device, the more profitable it is. If you want to try your luck at Bitcoin mining, then this Bitcoin miner is probably the best deal. Bitcoin mining software. There are two basic ways to mine, on your own or as a part of a Bitcoin mining pool, or with Bitcoin cloud mining contracts, and be sure to avoid Bitcoin cloud mining scams. 
Almost all miners choose to mine in a pool because it smooths out the luck inherent in the Bitcoin mining process. Before you join a pool, make sure you have a Bitcoin wallet so you have a place to store your Bitcoins. Next, you will need to join a mining pool and set your miners to connect to that pool. With pool mining, the profits from each block any pool member generates is divided up among the members of the pool according to the amount of hashes they contributed. How much bandwidth does Bitcoin mining take? If you are using a Bitcoin miner for mining with a pool, then the amount should be negligible with about 10 megabytes a day. However, what you do need is exceptional connectivity so that you get any updates on the work as fast as possible. This gives the pool members a more frequent, steady payout. This is called reducing your variance. But your payout or payouts can be decreased by whatever fee the pool might charge. Solo mining will give you large, infrequent payouts, and pooled mining will give you small, frequent payouts. But both add up to the same amount if you're using a zero-fee pool in the long term. Bitcoin Cloud Mining By purchasing Bitcoin cloud mining contracts, investors can earn Bitcoins without dealing with the hassles of mining hardware, software, electricity, bandwidth, or other offline issues. Being listed in this section is not an endorsement of these services and is to serve merely as a Bitcoin cloud mining comparison. There have been a tremendous amount of Bitcoin cloud mining scams. Hashflare Review Hashflare offers SHA-256 mining contracts and more profitable SHA-256 coins can be mined while automatic payouts are still in BTC. Customers must purchase at least 10 GHS. Genesis Mining Review Genesis Mining is the largest Bitcoin and script cloud mining provider. Genesis Mining offers three Bitcoin cloud mining plans that are reasonably priced. Zcash mining contracts are also available. Hashing24 Review Hashing24 has been involved with Bitcoin mining since 2012. They have facilities in Iceland and Georgia. They use modern ASIC chips from Bitfury to deliver the maximum performance and efficiency possible. What is Bitcoin mining? Bitcoin mining is the process of adding transaction records to Bitcoin's public ledger of past transactions. This ledger of past transactions is called the blockchain, as it is a chain of blocks. The blockchain serves to confirm transactions to the rest of the network as having taken place. Bitcoin nodes use the blockchain to distinguish legitimate Bitcoin transactions from attempts to re-spend coins that have already been spent elsewhere. Bitcoin mining is intentionally designed to be resource intensive and difficult so that the number of blocks found each day by miners remains steady. Individual blocks must contain a proof of work to be considered valid. This proof of work is verified by other Bitcoin nodes each time they receive a block. Bitcoin uses the hash cash proof of work function. The primary purpose of mining is to allow Bitcoin nodes to reach a secure, tamper-resistant consensus. Mining is also the mechanism used to introduce Bitcoins into the system. Miners are paid any transaction fees, as well as a subsidy of newly created coins. This both serves the purpose of disseminating new coins in a decentralized manner, as well as motivating people to provide security for the system. Bitcoin mining is so called because it resembles the mining of other commodities. It requires exertion and it slowly makes new currency available at a rate that resembles the rate at which commodities like gold are mined from the ground. What is proof of work? A proof of work is a piece of data which was difficult, costly, time consuming to produce so as to satisfy certain requirements. It must be trivial to check whether data satisfies said requirements. Producing a proof of work can be a random process with low probability, so that a lot of trial and error is required on average before a valid proof of work is generated. Bitcoin uses the hash cash proof of work. What is Bitcoin mining difficulty? The computationally difficult problem. Bitcoin mining a block is different because the SHA-256 hash of a block's header must be lower than or equal to 
the target in order for the block to be accepted by the network. This problem can be simplified for explanation purposes. The hash of a block must start with a certain number of zeros. The probability of calculating a hash that starts with many zeros is very low. Therefore, many attempts must be made. In order to generate a new hash each round, a nonce is incremented. See Proof of Work for more information. The Bitcoin Network Difficulty Metric The Bitcoin Mining Network Difficulty is the measure of how difficult it is to find a new block compared to the easiest it can ever be. It is recalculated every 2016 blocks to a value such that the previous 2016 blocks would have been generated in exactly two weeks had everyone been mining at this difficulty. This will yield, on average, one block every 10 minutes. As more miners join, the rate of block creation will go up. As the rate of block generation goes up, the difficulty rises to compensate, which will push the rate of block creation back down. Any blocks released by a malicious miners that do not meet the required difficulty target will simply be rejected by everyone on the network and thus will be worthless. The Block Reward When a block is discovered, the discoverer may award themselves a certain number of bitcoins, which is agreed upon by everyone in the network. Currently, this bounty is 25 bitcoins. This value will have every 210,000 blocks. See Controlled Currency Supply or use a Bitcoin mining calculator. Additionally, the miner is awarded the fees paid by users sending transactions. The fee is an incentive for the miner to include the transaction in their block. In the future, as the number of new Bitcoin miners are allowed to create and each block dwindles, the fees will make up a much more important percentage of mining income. Chapter 9 Best Bitcoin Business Ideas and Opportunities The use of digital currencies like Bitcoin is continuing to grow around the world, whilst at the same time new applications for the blockchain technology which underpins it are popping up constantly. This creates a huge range of opportunities for entrepreneurs to capitalize on. Establishing your business within a young and growing industry like this may be seen as risky by some, but it also offers the potential for phenomenal growth rates. Personally, I would also suggest that it is an exciting and rewarding business to get into, giving you the chance to be part of something big while helping to take the power back from the banks and return it to the people. If you are an entrepreneur or would like to be one, then I have some good news for you. Profitable Bitcoin business ideas are not hard to come by. That doesn't mean that it will be easy for you to make money or that you are guaranteed success. But the first step of finding interesting opportunities that are worthy of consideration should not be a barrier to anybody willing to invest their time and or money into digital currency. In this article, you will find a selection of the best off-the-shelf Bitcoin business opportunities that you could set up right now, as well as a few more general ideas to help spark the imagination and inspire those among you who prefer to forge your own independent business path. Becoming a Bitcoin Broker Perhaps one of the most obvious as well as one of the most popular ways to start a business in this industry is to set yourself up as a broker buying and selling coins to other users. Unlike other areas of finance, digital currency users often have a preference for using peer-to-peer -peer services rather than large companies. This preference extends to exchanges, meaning that it is very easy for a small trader to set themselves up as a broker in their local area or over the Internet. In fact, one of the world's most popular services for buying and selling BTC is local bitcoins, which is entirely based around peer-to-peer -peer transactions and hosts thousands of small traders earning a living as brokers. As a broker, you earn your profit from the spread, the difference between bid and ask prices. This varies according to market conditions and the payment method you are using. But you can get a rough idea simply by visiting the buy and sell pages on the site for your local area. BTMs, operating a Bitcoin ATM. If you have enough capital behind you, then a more easily scalable and potentially more profitable way to set up a business buying and selling coins is by operating specialist 
automatic teller machines, ATMs, sometimes known as Bitcoin teller machines, BTM. Fees charged by BTM seem to start around the range of 5 to 10% per transaction, and in some cases are a lot higher. Operators who manage to get their machines into the best locations often report ROI for their initial capital in less than a year. These machines do not take up a lot of space, so renting locations doesn't need to cost the earth. But with the cost of the machine itself and the requirement to stock it with notes, the initial outlay can be quite high. There are a wide range of machines available to buy, and they usually allow you to set your own fees to the level you want. Some machines will also allow you to connect to a third-party exchange through an API in order to manage your currency risk by keeping your reserves of both BTC and your local fiat at a constant level. Most machines will incorporate some form of KYC requirements, but it is important for operators to keep abreast of local regulatory requirements and ensure that their machines comply with the law. If you are already the owner of a retail location, then running a BTM may be a particularly attractive proposition. And some systems have been designed with dual functionality for this reason. Several major BTM manufacturers have included point-of-sale, POS, systems into their machine, whilst at the same time POS terminal providers such as CoinKite offer exchange features that enable cashiers to buy or sell coins from the till. Here is a list of some of the most popular options. Romit, kiosks and ATMs with point-of-sale app and integrated remittance options. Bit Access, fully featured ATM machines with note recycling, customizable compliance options, and remote management. General Bytes, offers a choice of full kiosk and combined POS system. Skyhook, powered by open source software, this machine supports a wide range of currencies. Lamasu offers a range of three different machines and is the market leader at the time of writing this article. Genesis Coin includes the option to brand the product through their white label system and had all the features you would expect. There's even a market out there for second-hand BTM machines. You can compare products and find cheap second-hand deals at Coin ATM Radar. Bitcoin Vending Machine Businesses there are many similarities between running a network of teller machines and running a vending machine business. Entrepreneurial salespeople with a strong knowledge of their local area can do well by placing these machines in strategic locations. One of the big limitations of vending machines is that many people simply don't carry a lot of change around with them and may not have the coins needed to make a purchase. As the use of cash continues to decline, this is likely to represent an ever-expanding opportunity to replace legacy systems with new machines capable of accepting alternative payment methods. Already, there are machines available to purchase which accept both credit and debit cards and Bitcoin. For example, Iguana sells a top spec system with digital display which they claim has driven an average 400% increase in sales on a like-for-like -like basis compared to traditional coin-operated machines during trials in the UK. If you don't mind getting your hands dirty or hiring an engineer, you can also retrofit pretty much any existing vending machine to accept BTC payments using something like the BitSwitch or alternatively, CryptoMechWitch, which runs its own installation service. White Label Business Opportunities A white label business is when another company allows you to take their product or service, rebrand it under your own name, and present it to the public as an independent business. Although the core product is not unique, these services often allow for a relatively high degree of customization. White Label Exchanges If you have ever thought of running your own cryptocurrency exchange website, then there are some significant advantages to going through the white label route. The first is that high quality exchange software capable of reliably matching and executing orders at high speeds is a complex and expensive thing to develop yourself. Setting up a white label exchange is a low cost way to get into this business, but should still allow you to select which coins and currencies you want to trade, set your own fees, and customize the user interface to suit your brand. A second major advantage is that these services usually allow you 
to share liquidity with other exchanges using the same network. Building enough liquidity on a new exchange to make it an attractive choice for users can be very difficult or very expensive and risky if you provide the liquidity yourself. Here is a list of the top white label Bitcoin exchange providers. W Locks, Alpha Point, BTC Trader, Draglet, White Label Casinos. Gambling has always been one of those areas in which the advantages of digital currency are most apparent. One of the reasons for this is because many countries do not classify it as being real money, which means that strict laws and regulations controlling online gambling may not apply to casinos which use BTC exclusively. If you fancy running your own casino, poker, or betting site, then there are many white label opportunities for you to take advantage of. These can range from a complete turnkey website, which just requires you to add your own branding and make sure that you're complying with local laws, to individual games that you can add to your own site. Here are three of the top providers of this service: Coin Gaming, Soft Swiss, and Betcoin Gaming. Other white label services. I'm sure that there are many other white label services out there offering services other than casinos and exchanges. This is a fast-paced industry, so it is well worth doing your own search if you think this is something you may like to do. But for now, I'll leave you with just one other service that you may like to take a look at. Ecoin offers entrepreneurs the same chance to white label their Bitcoin debit card service, and it includes the ability to access their service through an API. https forward slash forward slash devportal dot e hyphen coin dot io. Bitcoin franchise opportunities. Choosing the franchise route means that you're not only provided with a product or service to sell, but you also get access to a proven strategy and business plan, and the rights to use an established brand that may already have name recognition. And may run its own advertising campaigns that you can benefit from. This can be seen as one step up from a white label in terms of the help and support you get from the company behind the product. But you do have to pay for this, as there is usually a fee which must be paid to purchase the franchise. If you are considering taking this route, then I would advise you do a little research to find the latest franchise offerings yourself. But to whet your appetite and perhaps. Save some of you the time and effort. Here are three of the most interesting franchises that I've been able to find. Number one, Coin Telegraph. One of the most well-known names in digital currency news, Coin Telegraph is offering foreign language franchises in many countries around the world. A similar model is being followed by another news site called News BTC. Number two, Coin Gaia. A Bitcoin exchange which is using a franchise model instead of the white label route for anybody looking to start their own exchange. Number three, Mega Big Power. If you've been thinking about setting up your own mining business but don't have the full capital outlay required, then this is worth looking into. You provide a premises and electricity, and they will provide ASIC mining machines and technical support to help you run them. Retail businesses. You can buy most things with Bitcoin today, but there are still opportunities available for new retail businesses which accept digital currency payments to make a name for themselves. The low transaction costs and freedom from chargebacks makes BTC payments an attractive proposition for retailers. And if you can pass on some of those savings to your customers in the form of discounts, you have a great chance to attract new business. Perhaps the easiest way to set up a new retail business. And take payment in BTC is using an internet shop builder service like Shopify, reseller, and dropship opportunities. If you are already involved in retail, or if this is a sector you are thinking about going into, you may also like to consider reselling Bitcoin-related products. For example, Crypto offers a way for retailers to sell Bitcoin in the form of scratch cards or vouchers. This is perfect for adding to the counter of a local news agent or grocery store, but can also be used by online businesses. There are also many digital products unrelated to digital currency which have reseller programs. This is a great way to get into retail without a huge expenditure on buying stock and making a product available to purchase for BTC 
may win you some business. You can even use a similar method to start selling physical products through drop shipping, which involves the retailer taking payment for a product from the customer and then immediately ordering it from their drop ship wholesaler, who ships the product direct to the consumer. Consider selling items on a decentralized marketplace using one of our guides, Syscoin for sellers and Open Bazaar for merchants. Monetizing trust, escrow agents and oracles. If you have built up a name for yourself as somebody that can be trusted, or if your business has, then you may like to consider monetizing this trust by setting yourself up as an escrow agent or oracle. The role of an escrow agent is to arbitrate over disputes. This may involve online purchases, freelance contracts, or other business and trade arrangements. The process is simple. Payment is made to a Bitcoin address, which requires any two signatures out of the buyer, the seller, and the escrow agent in order to send a transaction. If there is no problem, then the buyer and seller sign and payment is made. But if there is a problem, then the escrow agent must choose whether to sign the payment or the refund. You can create a profile on websites like Bitrated to promote your services as an escrow agent. Another business which requires a certain degree of trust from your customers is the role of the Oracle. Oracles publish information over the blockchain which can be used for betting, for financial derivatives, or for smart contracts. Take a look at our article on how to become a Bitcoin Oracle for more information about this. Consultancy Business If you are reading this article, then you probably know more about Bitcoin than 99% of other people at the very least. So why not put that knowledge to good use by helping other businesses? Both Bitcoin itself and the blockchain technology which underpins it offer a wealth of opportunities, not only for setting up a new business, but also within established businesses. Unfortunately, most companies just don't know how to take advantage of them. This doesn't just stop at accepting Bitcoin payments. It could involve using the blockchain for low-cost notary services as an asset registry, smart contracts, and a lot more besides. Although anybody looking to set themselves up as a consultant must be careful not to overstate their expertise, most general consultancies have teams of people with different backgrounds, including programming, law, and other areas. There are still profitable niches that anybody with a bit of experience and a willingness to research could take advantage of. For example, approaching small and medium-sized retailers in your area and offering to guide them through the various point-of-sale options or offering to conduct a presentation on blockchain notary services to a local law firm as a general introduction to what it can offer. Flipping websites, apps, and businesses. Business flipping is when you buy a business, increase its profitability, or turn it around entirely if it's making a loss, and then sell it on a relatively short period of time. The term is more commonly used for online businesses in the form of website or app flipping, but can also be applied to bricks and mortar businesses. There are many different websites and apps which could benefit from integrating digital currency into what they offer. It is also possible to buy websites and apps for much less than most other businesses and to flip them within a fairly short period of time. Integrating digital currency for in-app purchases or for user reward schemes or simply converting stores to accept BTC payments may be worth considering as ways to add value to an established business. It is not beyond the imagination to think that some offline businesses may present similar opportunities for an entrepreneur to add value in a short space of time by introducing the use of blockchain technology. Bitcoin websites and faucets. At the risk of creating more competition for ourselves, another possibility is to create a Bitcoin-related website. When it comes to monetizing your site, there are many advertising networks and affiliate programs which pay out in Bitcoin. One of the most popular categories of website in this area is the faucet, a website which pays out a small amount of Bitcoin to new users for testing or just for fun. Chapter 10. Bitcoin for Investment. Is Bitcoin a good investment? Questions about the value of Bitcoins as an investment will likely differ depending on who you ask. Those with a vision of a fully distributed future in which the lack of a centralized overseer becomes key to an asset's value will tell you that, yes, 
Bitcoins are poised to become only more valuable in the future. Others who put more value in the traditional trust afforded by banks and government institutions would likely steer you away from Bitcoins as an investment. While determining how good any investment will be is ultimately a guessing game, there are some tried and true ways to determine an asset's worth. One of the simplest ways to think about Bitcoin as an investment is to consider its rise against the U.S. dollar. Recently, Bitcoin prices eclipsed $1,000 and have reached beyond $1,500. If you had invested in the digital currency when its worth was still hovering around $150 just a few years ago, or when it was first introduced in 2009, and worth noting against the dollar, you would probably be convinced that it made for a good investment. Furthermore, an underpinning concept behind Bitcoin is that there will only ever be 21 million tokens, meaning that it may stay consistently valuable or increase in value relative to other types of currency which can be printed endlessly. Other reasons that the asset seems like a good investment include its growing popularity, network efforts, security, immutability, and status as the first ever in a growing world of digital currencies. That being said, there is at least one significant argument for limiting Bitcoins to a small portion of your portfolio at the most. Bitcoin is known for stark jumps in price, high peaks, and deep valleys that would make it difficult to have confidence in the asset as a long-term moneymaker that can be depended on. Tying every dime you have to such a volatile asset would be imprudent. A good rule to follow is never to invest more than what you would be willing to lose. Managing Enormous Risk Bitcoin and Altcoin Investment Strategies While some have made millions investing in digital currencies, others would call it degenerate gambling. If you're reading this, then you know how exciting and unpredictable the crypto world is. Fortunes are built and demolished in seconds. New and exciting technology pops up every day, and controversy rules the land. It's pretty much the Wild West of finance. The unprecedented growth of cryptocurrencies has attracted investors from all walks of life, many of whom have been enticed by the staggering returns made by early investors. If this sounds like you, then keep reading. Unfortunately, we're not going to teach you how to get rich in a few days. In fact, we're going to try and deter you from that objective. Not that we don't want you to be super rich, don't get us wrong, but we prefer to have more grounded goals and we want you to do the same. Investment is a tricky game and the patient person usually wins. Avoiding fear of missing out, FOMO, is essential, especially in crypto, where disinformation, fake news, and drama are commonplace. So what exactly is the point of this article, you may wonder? Well, today, we want to give new players in the crypto sphere some ideas on how they can begin to navigate the tricky world of investment. We feel this is important due to the growing amount of scams and low-quality projects out there. We're not saying that the strategies we discuss are foolproof or even profitable. They are not based on any mathematical formula, nor were they devised by an experienced investment professional. These are simple ideas that are popular among entrants and old-school digital currency investors alike. It's important to note that this article is not to be taken as investment advice and that you should always remember the golden rule of investment. Never invest more than what you can afford to lose. Diversify and play it safe. This is a simple one. If your portfolio only has one coin on it, you're doing it wrong. Now, we know some people will say Bitcoin is the only cryptocurrency you should own. But at this point, it's safe to say that this is an absurd statement founded on feelings and ideas rather than actual facts. Bitcoin is thriving because it is the first and most popular cryptocurrency out there. It has the first mover advantage, and it is also backed by an extensive network of miners who keep it safe. In terms of technology or features, however, Bitcoin falls short of its peers. We're not saying you shouldn't have Bitcoin, but you should also acknowledge other cryptocurrencies out there. It may be a good idea to play it safe, however, and to bet on the most popular coins only, such as the top 10 by market capitalization. 
At present, those are Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, Dash, NEM, NEO, BitConnect, and Monero. Bet on the idea, not the project. The world of blockchain technology has evolved to a point where currency is just one of the many functions a cryptocurrency can have. There are smart contract platforms like Ethereum, NEO, and Qtum. There are decentralized storage networks like Storage, SiaCoin, and Filecoin. And there are decentralized exchange platforms like Waves, BitShares, and others. Our suggestion is, instead of buying one cryptocurrency in each category, you should spread your investment throughout multiple options inside each category. This will allow you to reduce the risk of investing in one single currency. In the world of crypto, a technical difficulty or even a grievance within one of the teams can lead to a rapid crash in the price, regardless of how promising the project and tech are. Just look at what happened with Tezos. Hedging. Again, diversification is the name of the game. If you're in crypto, then you are probably aware of how risky it all is. The cryptocurrency movement could end in days if some major security flaw was discovered or if all governments decided to ban them. The same can happen if some new and improved alternative to blockchain technology comes along. These are, of course, worst-case scenarios that are unlikely but possible nonetheless. So if you're not one to have all your eggs in the same basket, you may want to extend your investment strategy to instruments outside of crypto. Precious metals, stocks, and other traditional investment vehicles may be a great addition to your portfolio and will allow you to reduce the risk you would take by investing in cryptocurrencies only. Some companies, for example, manage cryptocurrency investment funds that combine cryptocurrency investments with investments in other sectors, like real estate. We talked to Kirill Bensonoff, CEO and founder of Caviar, about the importance of heeding your investment in the cryptocurrency space with traditional instruments. He stated, We found a couple of major issues with crypto asset investing. Namely, it's difficult and time-consuming, and all assets are highly correlated. There is no safety asset that also produces an income. We also see a movement towards having crypto be backed by traditional assets, such as gold, real estate, and others. And we are addressing this head-on. Liquidity, liquidity, liquidity. This is something that many new players forget about. You may find yourself investing in a cryptocurrency, having it increase in value several times over, only to realize that you can't really sell it. If you try to sell large amounts at once, you'll crash the price. Why? Because there is no liquidity. If a coin has no trading volume, significant price swings are bound to happen. You can play it safe and avoid low-volume coins altogether, but if you don't want to, the least you can do is to know the risk you're taking. Crypto Compare has a portfolio tool that allows you to analyze several risk factors in your portfolio, including volatility, exposure, and, of course, liquidity. Their tool allows you to get an estimate of how long it would take to sell a certain coin based on the current volume. We asked Charles Hader, CEO of Crypto Compare, why this tool is important for entrant users. He stated, We want to make it easy for users to track how well they're doing. Crypto is risky in the extreme, and we want to help people understand where these risks lie and how to quantify them. Room to Grow Remember what we just told you about liquidity? Well, this strategy is somewhat contradictory, but it's important to note that not all of these strategies are compatible with one another. Also, some involve more risk than others, and this one is risky. So what do we mean with room to grow? Small market cap cryptocurrencies have more growth potential than the ones at the top. Of course, other factors will determine if the price will rise or not, but the idea is that if you invest in cryptocurrencies before they are big, you may get to see your investment grow several times over. Now, Before you go to the nearest exchange and start stacking up on useless meme coins, have a think about what you want to buy. Then perform your due diligence. Check the roadmap. Check the team. Read the white paper. Learn about the technology. Do everything in your power to ensure that your investment is justified. This will also make it easier for you to stick to your strategy, knowing that you are invested in something you believe in. 
technical analysis. Yes, chart wizardry. To be honest, I have no idea how it works, and I admire anyone that does. All those numbers and lines give me headaches. Nevertheless, if you have it in you, learning TA can do wonders for your investment strategy, even if you only touch the surface. We asked Jonathan Hobbs, CFA and author of Stop Saving, Start Investing, 10 Simple Rules for Effectively Investing in Funds Investment Book, how technical analysis can be useful even for a newbie investor. He stated, any good investment strategy needs rules. Technical analysis, or TA, uses rules to look for price and volume patterns in charts to try and predict what's going to happen next. It helps investors choose when to buy or sell. One example of TA is the Simple Moving Average, or SMA. The 50-day SMA, for instance, is the average price over the last 50 days which changes or moves each day. When an investment starts trading above its SMA, this could be a bullish sign. Since TA can also protect the downside, it's a good risk management tool for volatile investments like cryptocurrencies. Proof of stake interest. A lot of people would love to invest in cryptocurrency mining, but at this point, you either go big or go home. Mining has become an industrialized practice reserved only for those with large financial backing, high-tech equipment, and access to low energy prices. Although there are several alternatives to traditional mining, proof of stake is the most relevant one for the subject at hand. To put it simply, proof of stake allows users to mine coins without mining equipment. In this system, the amount of coins a user holds will determine how many coins he mines. Although most POS cryptocurrencies will require you to leave your wallet running, some implementations of POS, like Waves and Lisk, allow you to earn interest by leasing or delegating your stake. Do note that you shouldn't go out and buy every POS coin out there. You should, however, check your holdings for those types of coins, and if you have them, mine them. In the worst case scenario, you'll need to leave the wallet running, which can be done with any laptop or even a Raspberry PI device. The security of Bitcoin. Not only has Bitcoin's value gone up over the past year, but the available options for Bitcoin storage have also increased. The choice can be especially intimidating for Bitcoin novices. No matter what you choose, however, there is always a trade-off between convenience and security. And while privacy is also a factor, here we assume you are not willing to go the extra step of anonymizing and completely eradicating your financial trail. Those interested in how to use Bitcoin with full anonymity, look at ExpressVPN's Guide to Bitcoin Anonymity, which includes a step-by-step -step tutorial. Classifications of Bitcoin Transactions Bitcoin usage can be separated into two independent variables, transaction volume and transaction value. Whether these values are high or low changes which Bitcoin wallet is best for you. Transaction volume is the rate of Bitcoin transactions you make. This might mean one transaction per day or only one per week. What counts as high or low in this case is fairly arbitrary. Transactional value is the Bitcoin value of a given transaction. What defines a large Bitcoin value is similarly ambiguous. A good rule of thumb is that a low transaction value is less than or equal to the amount of money you'd be comfortable carrying around as cash in your pocket. Everything larger than that might be high value. Multiple Bitcoin wallets might be the best solution for you. There is absolutely no need for you to restrict yourself to a simple solution. Maybe the way you use Bitcoin includes all the use cases listed below, such as regular small payments, regular large payments, and long-term investments. Use multiple options in parallel to make the most of keeping Bitcoins both accessible and secure. Find the Bitcoin solution for you. If you make many transactions of low value, mobile wallet. If you're making a lot of transactions with low value, e.g. because you mostly use Bitcoin to buy socks, tea, or a VPN, then you should use a mobile wallet that you control the keys to. With a mobile wallet, your Bitcoins are always accessible as long as your phone has power. If you use a modern smartphone with an up-to-date operating system, your Bitcoins are secure. 
don't forget to back up your seed phrase on a piece of paper and store that paper somewhere securely. Have a look at our recommendations for Android and iOS Bitcoin wallets. If you make many transactions of high value, hardware wallet. If a lot of money is at stake, like if you conduct a business that deals with Bitcoin a lot, or because you pay some of your stuff in cryptocurrency, then you need a hardware wallet. Hardware wallets look like USB sticks and store your Bitcoin private keys on a specialized chip, similar to the secure enclave in an iPhone. Even if your phone or computer were to get hacked, your hardware wallet would be unaffected. Since the wallet is password protected, someone who steals or finds your wallet would not be able to access it. Unlike all other options, hardware wallets cost money, ranging from $29 for the cheapest ledger wallet to $99 for the Trezor, which also acts as a FIDO U2F key. As with other wallets, you should store a backup of your seed on a piece of paper somewhere and keep it in a safe place. That way, if you lose your hardware wallet, you don't lose your bitcoins. If you make few transactions of high value, paper wallet. If you have significant savings in bitcoin that you do not need to spend or more frequently, then a paper wallet is best for you. Don't use an online service to create your paper wallet, but rather create one yourself. The most secure option is to get yourself a copy of the operating system Tails, which comes with the Bitcoin wallet Electrum installed. Crawl under a blanket or tent, boot it up, and create a Bitcoin wallet. You write down the seed on a piece of paper and shut down the computer. As Tails, by default, keeps no data on your USB stick and wipes the internal RAM, there are no traces of your seed left on the computer. As long as you can secure the paper, your Bitcoins are secure. Have a look at ExpressVPN's Bitcoin security tips. To send your Bitcoins, you will have to, again, boot into a Tails instance and restore a wallet using the seed from your paper. If you make few transactions of low value, online wallet. If you only keep a small amount of Bitcoin and rarely spend them, have a look at an online wallet service like blockchain.info. They also have an Onion site. Unlike with your mobile wallet, you will not have to worry what happens when you switch devices. You can log into your account using an email address and a password. When you sign up, carefully go through the security options to lock down your account from hackers while keeping it accessible to you. Using a strong password and a password manager is a good idea. Many Bitcoin wallets for many uses. There are many ways to use Bitcoin and as many ways to keep them. Be aware of what you want to use your Bitcoins for and how accessible they need to be. There is often a trade-off between accessibility and security. But by spreading your Bitcoins across different wallets, you can find the optimal situation. Chapter 11. Awesome Facts About Bitcoin Here are 10 awesome Bitcoin facts, success or disasters that you may not be aware of. Enjoy! Bitcoin studies. You suddenly wish you could go back to university, but you only have bitcoins left because of your forward-thinking state of mind. Do not panic. You are now able to pay your tuition fees with bitcoins for the famous New Yorker University of the King's College. However, if you are not living on American soil, be aware that it exists the same kind of initiative, for example, by the University of Cumbria in the United Kingdom, or also by the University of Nicosia in Cyprus. The latter also features a degree in digital currencies for its students that highlights Bitcoin. Bitcoin Boulevard. Are you visiting the Netherlands? Do not miss the Bitcoin Boulevard located in The Hague, which offers a unique feature. A high majority of shopkeepers who are located on the two streets that go alongside the channel, Burkade and Groenweg, now accept Bitcoin following an initiative submitted by Hendrik Jan Hillbowling and Peter Klassen. You can therefore have dinner in one of the nine restaurants that participate in the operation, or you can go shopping in the art gallery also located there, thanks to your favorite cryptocurrency. Some other streets seem to follow the same move. In particular, in the United States, for example, the North American Bitcoin Boulevard, located in Cleveland Heights in Ohio. The first transaction. Bitcoin has enabled 43,472,000 
379 transactions since its creation through its network. However, you will be certainly interested in knowing who initiated the first transaction. It is no one else but Satoshi Nakamoto, the fantastic Bitcoin and underlying technology creator, who sent a 100 Bitcoins to Hal Finney on January 12, 2009. Hal Finney has been involved for a long time in the cryptography community. For years, he's been working with PGP Corporation, developing one of the most famous encryption systems. The company was holding the rights for the PGP system, developed at the origin by Phil Zimmerman. He launched the first anonymous remailer used to encode his emails and was also implicated in the cypherpunks movement. On a Bitcoin Talks post, Hal explained how it happened. When Satoshi announced the first release of the software, I grabbed it right away. I think I was the first person besides Satoshi to run Bitcoin. I mined block 70-something, and I was the recipient of the first Bitcoin transaction when Satoshi sent 10 coins to me as a test. I carried on an email conversation with Satoshi over the next few days, mostly me reporting bugs and him fixing them. After a few days, Bitcoin was running pretty stably, so I left it running. Those were the days when difficulty was won, and you could find blocks with a CPU, not even a GPU. I mined several blocks over the next days, but I turned it off because it made my computer run hot, and the fan noise bothered me. In retrospect, I wish I'd kept it up longer, but on the other hand, I was extraordinarily lucky to be there at the beginning. It's one of those glass half full, half empty things. The million dollar Bitcoin pizza. On May 22nd, 2010, a Bitcoiner named Laszlo Hanez paid to a Bitcoin Talks forum user not less than 10,000 BTC for two Papa John's pizzas. What can be considered as an incredible amount today was equivalent to about 30 bucks according to the exchange rate applied at the time, estimated to be 0.003 cents per Bitcoin. Mr. Hanez said he had acquired these Bitcoins by mining on his computer. It wasn't like Bitcoins had any value back then, so the idea of trading them for pizza was incredibly cool, said Mr. Hanez. But when asked about the current value of the cryptocurrency, he adds, no one knew it was going to get so big. Questioned about possible regrets, he adds, No, not really, Mr. Hanya said. Then he sold his bitcoins when the price was around a dollar, getting $4,000. That was enough to get a new computer and a couple of new video cards. So I'd say I ended up on top. A Bitcoin Master Swindle On November 4th, 2011, a Bitcoin Talks forum user named Pirate at 40 announced the creation of a Bitcoin investment fund promising to the investors a return on investment of 7% per week. Despite numerous suspicious elements and ridiculous incentives to invest, such as, it's growing, it's growing, I have yet to come close to taking a loss on any deal, and even, risk is almost zero. The fund encountered a fast and great success. According to the SEC report, more than 700,000 467 BTC, the equivalent of $411 million, have been collected by Trendon Shavers, a.k.a. Pirate at 40. Contrary to the presentations made to the investors, the fund was not performing any trading activities. In addition, the users have never seen their invested bitcoins again. More bitcoin users in Poland than in France... While France is way ahead in terms of GDP, 2,737,361 millions of USD, FMI 2013, at the fifth position, and Poland is at the 22nd position, 516,128 millions of USD, FMI 2013, it seems that there are more Bitcoin users in Poland than in France. This is the stunning fact that the download statistics of the most downloaded Bitcoin client, Bitcoin Core, totalizing 5 million plus downloads, seem to indicate since January 2009. It has been downloaded 124,748 times by users having an IP located in Poland since January 2009 against 106,780 in France. 
A first sketch of the explanation can be found in the progressive state of mind adopted by the Polish government. Everything that is not forbidden is allowed. However, in light of EU legislation, we can't recognize Bitcoin as legal tender or electronic money. Bitcoin capital gains are taxed as ordinary income. We don't stand in the way of Bitcoin's development, but we need a declaration from its users whether they expect any regulations to be introduced or rather prefer the government to stand aside. Kritzoff Peak, PhD from Warsaw School of Economics, said that Poland is in the top 10 in the number of Bitcoins mined, and Polish Bitcoin trading volume is one of the biggest in the world. He also emphasized Bitcoin's potential for the Polish economy. However, to reassure our French readers, we want to add that in terms of Bitcoin nodes, one has to admit that France keeps a clear advantage. 64% is the estimated part of ghost Bitcoins on the blockchain. According to a study made by the California University, the history of Bitcoin is regularly studied by stories of users who have lost their private keys and who are not still able to use their Bitcoins. Here are two examples of Bitcoins that haven't been spent for a very, very long time. An address created on March 1st, 2011, contains 75,957 Bitcoins which have never been spent. And an address created earlier on April 5th, 2010, has 28,000 150 bitcoins, which have never been spent. The computing power of the Bitcoin network is 7,468 times higher than the one of the cumulative 500 world supercomputers. Indeed, the computing power of the whole Bitcoin network is estimated to be 2,046,364 PFLOP against 274 PFLOP for the cumulative 500 most powerful world supercomputers. First of all, it is important to note that Bitcoin miners are not performing any floating point operations, flop, but only integer calculus. How have we then been able to proceed? It's very easy, in fact. One hash equals 6.35K integer operations. One integer operation equals two floating point operations. One hash equals 12.7K floating point operations. So much computing power that could have possibly been used in modelization purposes for medicine, astronomy, physics. Damn Bitcoiners. The largest transaction ever made on the network. 194,993 BTC. It represents more than $114 million, according to the effective rate, on July 31st, 2014. A shitload of money is the comment submitted by the recipient of the funds about the transaction. We can only agree. Bitcoin's Tiger Woods. In October 2009, so more than 10 months after the launch of the cryptocurrency, the Bitcoins were traded at an extremely competitive rate. One dollar for 1,309 BTC, which is equivalent to less than 0.00076 cents per Bitcoin. Assuming you had spent $308 in order to acquire your first 403,712 Bitcoins, and that you would have sold them in December 2013 at the famous peak of 1240 per Bitcoin, you would have a fortune of 501 million 556,440 dollars, which is the personal wealth of Tiger Woods. Not a golf fan? No problem. Let's focus on soccer. You would have to have spent 80 dollars in bitcoins, 104,720 BTC, in order to overtake the fortune of the international star Cristiano Ronaldo, namely 130 million dollars. Chapter 12. Cryptocurrency market moving beyond Bitcoin? More than a currency exchange, more than a simple coin, this is the power of Ethereum. There's no way you've missed seeing Ethereum mentioned if you've been involved in any way with cryptocurrencies, and with good reason. Ethereum began out of a need to see Bitcoin's underlying technology, 
the blockchain, used for something greater than simply sending currency from one user to another. Vitalik, the creator of Ethereum, built the system to be a world computer, incorporating a virtual machine, EVM, a Turing complete language, Solidity and Viper, a token, ETH, and fuel, gas. What is Ethereum? Ether, traded under the code ETH, can be purchased at exchanges and used to pay for products and services at most merchants that accept cryptocurrencies. After all, it's the second biggest cryptocurrency by market cap at the time of writing. Ether is also used to pay for transaction fees and for computational services when using the Ethereum network. Ether is mined similarly to Bitcoin, i.e., you set your computer to attempt to solve the question present on a particular block in the blockchain. Once you find the answer, you get paid in ETH. However, the goal of Ethereum is to be something greater than a coin. Not happy with how the blockchain technology was being underutilized by Bitcoin, the creators of Ethereum set out to truly take the blockchain to the next level. They envisage a method to decentralize the Internet itself. Why a decentralized system? To understand what a decentralized system is, you need to understand how our current networking systems work, i.e. centralized systems. Let's say you have an online account where you store photos. Let's call it Cloud Photo. You can upload photos to Cloud Photo, and you can access those photos from anywhere. Now, let's say something goes wrong and Cloud Photo's servers burn down. Unfortunately, you can't access your photos, and they are all lost. This is a centralized system. Usually, we mitigate this scenario by creating backups of our data, making copies of the same data and storing them elsewhere, or by keeping different groups of data on different servers. This decentralizes the system. Decentralization is also beneficial in cases where you need to maintain the integrity of data. For example, keeping all the student grades at a school on one computer is a problem because if someone hacks into that computer and changes those grades, then there would be no way to catch the change. If 10 different computers held on to the student scores, it would be easy to recognize that one of the computers holding the data is wrong and consequently fix that data set. So a decentralized system is one where there is no single point of failure. This has many obvious advantages, and you need to keep that in mind when considering Ethereum. Ethereum Virtual Machine and DAPPS Decentralized Applications, or DAPs, is the driving force behind Ethereum's development, and they run on the Ethereum Virtual Machine, also known as the World Computer. This virtual machine is Ethereum's defining development, and it allows applications to run on the blockchain. As discussed in the Why a Decentralized System section, centralized systems suffer from single points of failures. If something were to happen to eBay and they didn't have any backups, you would lose all evidence of your hard-earned success. Decentralized apps run on the blockchain and make use of it to maintain data scattered across all users of Ethereum. The data sets are, of course, encrypted so as not to be accessible by everyone, but everyone would be able to verify and validate the data if the need arises. There are already many dApps, from online gambling to prediction markets and social media platforms, and most likely there are many more to come. The DAO Hack Smart contracts are the basis of the Ethereum ecosystem and platform. Someone creates a contract with rules and triggers, and the smart contract executes when the trigger event occurs, as long as all the rules can be enforced. The Decentralized Autonomous Organization, or DAO, was to be the crown jewel of the Ethereum smart contract and virtual machine ecosystem, a smart contract that was going to build a decentralized venture capital fund with the aim of providing funding for all future DAP development. People would invest into the DAO and they would be allowed to vote on which DAPs got funding and which did not. The DAO launched on April 30th, 2016 and within 28 days it had accumulated 
more than $150 million worth of ETH. The attack happened on June 17, 2016, and it worked by exploiting a loophole in the way investors left the DAO. If you wanted to leave the DAO as an investor, you were allowed to take all the ETH you had invested after you returned the DAO tokens you had been given when investing, a sort of stakeholder system. The problem was that the contract had two steps as outlined above. Number one, take DAO tokens from user and give back ETH from DAO to user. And number two, register the transaction in the blockchain and update the DAO token count. The hack was simple in hindsight. Inject a step between step one and step two above, where before the transaction gets registered, the DAO would give the same user more ETH for the same tokens. This hack cost the DAO $50 million worth of ETH and caused the value of ETH to plummet from $20.17 US to $11.52 in 48 hours. Ethereum Classic Ethereum Classic, ETC, is a fork of Ethereum, ETH, which came about as a result of the way the developers and community behind Ethereum decided to handle the DAO attack. After the DAO attack, the Ethereum community agreed that the best course of action was to hold the money taken by the hacker and return everything to the people who invested in the DAO, practically rewinding the hacker's attack. Many Ethereum users did not agree with this, as, in their opinion, it went against the core philosophy of cryptocurrencies. The blockchain is immutable and should not be affected by the whims of its users. Reverting the attack and forking the code to reset the blockchain went against the core philosophy that the code is law, and so many people stayed with the original blockchain, Ethereum Classic. Where can I use ETH? ETH has been on the rise since its inception and has been enjoying widespread acceptance by investors, exchanges, and merchants. At the time of writing this in September 2017, websites using cart software like WooCommerce and OpenCart can be set up to accept ETH payments, and we will likely be seeing even more merchants popping up online that accept ETH. But currently, in September 2017, the biggest use for ETH is as a stake in Ethereum, an investment in the smart contract platform of the future. Perhaps that future will include a completely decentralized Internet, where the centralized system of DNS and servers has become obsolete, returning power to the users themselves. How do I invest in Ethereum? There are many ways to invest in Ethereum, the simplest of which is to buy some ETH and hold it. As more users buy ETH, more merchants will likely see the value of accepting ETH as payment, which may increase the value of the coin. An increase in the value of the coin would give more strength to the developers behind the Ethereum network and the dApps running on it, and this would in turn increase the value of your held assets. ETH went from 12.836 US dollars per Ethereum in February 2017 to $343.949 in just four months. That's incredible growth. And while the coin is currently struggling to break the resistance at US 380 to 390, September 2017, if it does eventually break it, there's no telling where it might go. How to transfer money with Ethereum. Transferring ETH works just as it would work with any other cryptocurrency. Number one, have some ETH in your wallet. The official Ethereum wallet can be downloaded either from GitHub or from the official website. Number two, scan or enter the recipient's address. Whether they provide you with the hashed wallet address or a QR code, just follow the simple instructions on your wallet of choice and you'll be done in no time. Number three, enter the amount and send. The transaction should be verified in a few seconds and you're done. Making money with Ethereum. Get paid in ETH. Adopting ETH as tender for your products or services is the simplest and most effective way of making money with a cryptocurrency like Ethereum. 
If you're a writer, designer, artist, or developer, you can ask to be paid in ETH. If you're selling clothes, vape products, posters, or DVDs, you can ask to be paid in ETH. Every sale affected with ETH helps Ethereum grow, and as it grows, so does the value of that same ETH sitting in your wallet. Invest in Ethereum. If you're willing to shell out some U.S. dollars or fiat currency of your choice, you can buy the ETH directly at an exchange and hold it. More people holding ETH in their wallet could instill confidence in the currency, and as confidence increases, so does the value of the coin. If you'd bought a thousand dollars worth of ETH in January 2017, in June you would have owned twenty-six thousand seven hundred and ninety-five dollars instead. What to watch out for? Ethereum is trying to be bigger and better than simple currencies like Bitcoin, but the huge advantage it offers might also be its downfall. Never just a coin. Ethereum wants to be something more than a cryptocurrency, and this might cause problems. A platform is harder to maintain, harder to develop, and harder to see adoption. A cryptocurrency is simple: buy and sell things using that currency. Bitcoin, for example. Is nothing more than a currency, and people, especially businesses and merchants, like simple things that just work. Big things in the future, with a roadmap as ambitious as Ethereum's, the road is bound to be a little rocky. After all, platforms have failed for introducing far smaller and far simpler new features that had unforeseen fatal side effects. This is obviously not a certainty, but it's good to be mindful of big changes coming. In the future of Ethereum, what's next for Ethereum? Ethereum's roadmap is sprawling and ambitious. Apart from a strong drive to have ETH accepted by more merchants, there are some promising things in Ethereum's future. More DApps. Ethereum is a platform for building decentralized apps, from smart contracts to crowdfunding projects to autonomous organizations. Just as a computer is only as effective as the software written for it, Ethereum is only as successful as the DApps running on it. This is definitely an exciting time for everyone, from simple users of Ethereum to investors, developers, and the cryptocurrency community as a whole. Proof of stake, similar to the proof of importance system used on NEM. Ethereum is working on shifting from a proof of work (POW) mining method to a proof of stake (POS) generation of ETH instead. POW is a system in which your computer works hard at some puzzle or other thing that helps maintain the integrity of the Ethereum platform, and your wallet is rewarded with some amount of ETH for your efforts. POS works by having a user lock up a percentage of their ETH assets in order to verify a segment of transactions on the Ethereum network, from which the user would receive ETH, possibly as part of the transaction fees paid in every transaction. This is considered a fairer system than POW, as it relies on the user having a stake in the platform instead of being able to purchase a strong computer that runs more computations than someone else's. Ripple, the fast money transfer network, Ripple, and its associated coin XRP, have been enjoying steady acceptance and growth over the last five years since their inception. Here's why: when talking about Ripple XRP, people often overlook the product that caused it to exist, the Ripple network. Unfortunately, even though it's been accepted by several banks as a legitimate money transfer system, the platform is a bit more complex to figure out than your regular cryptocurrency. So we're going to go through it and explain every piece along the way. What is Ripple? The goal of Ripple is to be a global settlement network, a platform to allow anyone to transfer money in any currency to any currency in a matter of seconds. This is an ambitious goal meant to eliminate the use of older systems like Western Union or SWIFT. The alternative Ripple proposes is the use of XRP as a common currency, underlying all money transfers between different currencies. USD is currently the most common currency. Not only are transaction fees much lower to convert from one currency to XRP and back, 
but transfers take a maximum of four seconds to execute and verify. Quite a few global banks have already started embracing Ripple as it saves them a lot of money in the long run by avoiding exchange fees. How is Ripple different from Bitcoin? The Ripple coin and the Ripple network have various advantages over Bitcoin as they've been built with slightly different purposes in mind. Fast and cheap. Ripple transaction processing only takes four seconds since it's significantly less active compared to Bitcoin. This has the added bonus of cheaper transaction fees, whereas the price for Bitcoin transactions has been on the rise lately as more people adopt the platform. Mining free. All the 100 billion XRP that it's possible to use on the platform already exist. While they're not all on the market, a few are released into the market every month to avoid flooding. There's no use mining as there is nothing of value to be added, unlike in more traditional cryptocurrencies. Bank acceptance. The Ripple platform and coin being accepted by banks gives the process legitimacy and, at least from an investor standpoint, can be a little more reassuring. This is not the case with Bitcoin and other currencies as they are seen as competition by the banks. Where can I use Ripple? XRP is still a long way from being as widely accepted as coins such as Bitcoin, Litecoin, or Ethereum. It was never the goal to use Ripple as a payment method. Instead, the aim has always been to use XRP to grease the wheels in order to make fiat money transfers easier, faster, and more secure. That said, there are quite a few merchants that accept Ripple, including hosting providers and vaping products merchants. A full list can be found on the XRP forum. How do I invest in Ripple? Rarely has a coin been considered so ripe for purchases as Ripple is in September 2017, selling at 0 0.0218 per XRP on the 1st of April 2017. The coin skyrocketed to 0 0.3973 per XRP in no more than 47 days. The price has since settled down a bit as speculators decide whether they want to invest in the coin or not, and banks shuffle funds around and investigate the platform. With more bank involvement will come greater growth. If you have no problem with the way Ripple has handled the initial XRP influx, see section below what to watch out for, centralization. And if you think more banks will accept Ripple as the de facto money transfer platform, then there may never be a better time to get in on Ripple than 2017. Using Ripple to transfer money. Transferring money with Ripple works like any other cryptocurrency. Number one, have some XRP available in your wallet. XRP wallets are the same as, for example, Bitcoin wallets. Buy XRP on an exchange and then transfer them to your wallet. Number two, scan or enter the recipient's address. Whether they provide you with the hashed wallet address or a QR code, just follow the simple instructions on your wallet of choice and you'll be done in no time. Number three, enter the amount and send. The transaction should be verified in a few seconds and you're done. Making money with Ripple. Unless you're a bank willing to invest into the Ripple platform and because there is no mining allowed on Ripple, there are only two major ways to make money from it. Get paid in Ripple. Adopting XRP will not only put you in a position where you can see returns on money that's sitting in your wallet, but you will also be helping the currency gain legitimacy and wider use. Being this early and this young, Ripple will benefit from any merchant accepting the currency. When it grows, everyone enjoys the fruits of their investment. Invest in Ripple. While the Ripple platform might not be easily accessible for investors, anyone can buy XRP and wait. The currency is growing and it is still in its infant stage. As more and more merchants and banks adopt the platform, the price will probably increase, the currency will grow, and the value of every wallet will grow with it. What to watch out for? As much as some people love Ripple, and see it as the next generation of cryptocurrencies, there are also some who have concerns over privacy and centralization. Privacy concerns. Cryptocurrency has always been considered the poster child of privacy and anonymity. 
Ripple's decision to market their platform exclusively to banks has been a cause of concern for some users who worry about Big Brother keeping an eye on their transactions. Centralization. Ripple's platform is extremely centralized, whereas most cryptocurrencies aim to be as decentralized as possible. The reason for this is that Ripple owns the vast majority of the coins available on the platform, while currencies like Bitcoin allow anyone to mine and acquire coins. The move to lock coins inside smart contracts was a step in the right direction to fix this issue. But every time the coins are released, they first go to Ripple to do with them as it pleases. What's next for Ripple? The company behind Ripple plans as a priority to improve the lack of decentralization from which the platform is currently suffering. By adding more trusted validator nodes, the company plans to shake off the image that it's just another central bank controlling the Ripple currency. With that said, the future of Ripple depends entirely on the adoption of the platform by banks, and that's where the focus of the people behind Ripple inevitably needs to be. As more banks join the network, the price of XRP will probably skyrocket, driving more people to the coin and enticing banks to join the platform. Without banks, the platform would likely die, and so will the investors attempting to push it forward. Luckily, that doesn't seem to be the future of this currency. Litecoin. Faster and more secure than Bitcoin, Litecoin has been enjoying explosive growth in 2017. Let's take a closer look at why. Having started from very modest origins and possessing only subtle technical improvements over Bitcoin, Litecoin has grown to become the second largest cryptocurrency on the market. It is now often characterized as the silver to Bitcoin's gold. But there's far more to the currency's sudden growth than meets the eye. What is Litecoin? Released on 7 October 2011 by former Google employee Charlie Lee, Litecoin LTC is an open-source peer-to-peer cryptocurrency, digital currency, operating independently of any country's central bank. While similar to Bitcoin in many ways, Litecoin also incorporates several improvements, such as segregated witness, which help reduce bottlenecks in the network and increase the speed with which transactions are carried out. Litecoin has experienced massive growth since its inception, reaching a $1 billion market cap in November 2013 and over four times that much by 2017. How is Litecoin different from Bitcoin? While there are a lot of similarities between Litecoin and its more widely accepted competitor, Bitcoin, Litecoin has a few distinct advantages when it comes to mining, transaction verification speed, and security. Higher volume of transactions. The segregated witness process increases the rate at which transactions are verified on the block, reducing the time for confirmation of payment from 10 minutes for Bitcoin to two and a half minutes for Litecoin. More secure. This faster processing time also helps maintain a secure environment by reducing the chance of double spending attacks, a hack in which the attacker spends the same money twice to pay for two different transactions. Larger coin limit. While Bitcoin has a maximum coin limit of 21 million coins, Litecoin has an upper limit of 84 million coins. Harder to mine. This might not be seen as an advantage at first glance, but because Litecoin uses script hashing instead of SHA-256, mining cannot be accelerated by using parallel processors, as can be done when Bitcoin mining. This has created a much more level playing field as opposed to the arms race that Bitcoin mining has become. Where can I use Litecoin? You can use Litecoin nearly anywhere you can use Bitcoin. Since its release, it has become the second largest cryptocurrency after Bitcoin, and merchants have been quick to adopt it. The Litecoin website has an always-growing list of services, merchants, and providers that accept Litecoin, ranging from financial consulting services to health and beauty product merchants. How do I invest in Litecoin? As with most other cryptocurrencies, there are quite a few ways to put some Litecoin in your wallet purchase directly from an exchange. 
The easiest and most straightforward method of acquiring Litecoin is to buy some from an exchange. Exchanges mostly accept credit card payments, checks, and some even money transfers, and will, in turn, deposit Litecoin into your wallet. Exchanges also usually charge a percentage fee for their service, typically in the 0.5 to 2% range, depending on the service provider and the volume of Litecoin you're exchanging. Receive payment in Litecoin. Whether you're providing a service or selling goods to a consumer, you can always accept Litecoin as payment just as you would any other currency. With its lower fees, commissions, and costs compared to receiving fiat money, i.e. government-issued currency, receiving payment in Litecoin results in more money in your pocket. Additionally, Litecoin transactions are secure, faster, and less susceptible to fraud. Earn Litecoin through mining. Generating Litecoin through the process known as mining is slow and requires specialized equipment to be worth the effort. But it is nonetheless a legitimate method of generating coins. You can just put your computer to work, validating and verifying transactions made on the Litecoin network by other users, and in return, you are paid in Litecoin. The faster you can mine, the more Litecoin you can make. Using Litecoin to transfer money. As with cryptocurrencies in general, payments with Litecoin are lightning fast and incredibly easy. To pay someone with Litecoin, number one, enter the person's address into your wallet application or scan the QR code that corresponds to that address. Number two, enter the amount of Litecoin you'd like to send. Number three, send. That's it. There's nothing else to it. Making money with Litecoin. Over the years, Litecoin has attracted a lot of speculators and currency investors looking to make money from the rise and fall of the cryptocurrency. Its most explosive growth came in 2017 on the heels of Bitcoin's meteoric rise, sitting at a measly $3.80 LTC on March 1st, 2017. It multiplied its value by an unprecedented 22 times in just six months to reach a high of 8409 LTC on September 1st, 2017. Because of its growing popularity and cost, many investors have taken to buying Litecoin and then reselling it when the price increases. This is a very popular strategy, but it also comes with its own pitfalls. Litecoin prices are extremely volatile. Quick rises often mean quick falls. And you should always be very careful and spend time studying the currency before making any costly investment decisions. What to watch out for? Not unlike its bigger sibling, Litecoin has its disadvantages. Here are a few of the cryptocurrency shortcomings. Not as widely accepted. Litecoin is still growing, and while its acceptance has become more and more common, Bitcoin is still the most commonly recognized cryptocurrency. Not different enough. Many consider Litecoin's technical improvements too subtle, and this might hinder Litecoin's growth. Faster transaction times and more difficulty in mining might be good enough reasons for specific use cases, but in the grand scheme of things, many are of the opinion that it does not differentiate itself from Bitcoin enough to sustain long-term growth. The future of Litecoin. Litecoin's market cap growth is not expected to slow down anytime soon which will lead to more and more businesses adopting the altcoin, either alongside Bitcoin or as a complete replacement. Additionally, a lot of work is being carried out on improving the network Litecoin runs on, which will improve the speed at which transactions are verified even further and will, more importantly, allow atomic swaps. With new Litecoin ATMs being installed and a growing number of companies slowly making the switch to Litecoin, its future is looking brighter than ever. Chapter 13, The Secrets of Cryptocurrency. There's been a lot of speculation around whether cryptocurrency is safe to use or whether it will be a bad investment. Recently, a debut developed between cryptocurrency investors and the business giants of the world. Just like every other debut, it has two sides to the story, pro-cryptocurrency or against cryptocurrency pro-cryptocurrency. As you know, cryptocurrency can be used for basically anything. This is how Lady Moan recently launched a major property development in Dubai. She believes that digital currency is a growing market that cannot be ignored. 
Meanwhile, a property developer in London is allowing tenants to pay deposits in bitcoins. Jan Quillen, the analyst for Swissquote, says that cryptocurrency still holds great potential. He said that this could be a potential safe haven. Less than 0.01% of the world's population is in possession of a Bitcoin wallet. He believes that if this number is to reach 1%, the demand for Bitcoins would be through the roof since there are only 18 million coins available. In short, the pros for cryptocurrency are, number one, cryptocurrency can be used to pay for anything. Number two, it's a growing market with the potential for success. Number three, the demand for digital money would skyrocket if the percentage of Bitcoin wallet holders reached 1%. Looking at these pros, one might think that cryptocurrency will indeed make for a good investment. However, there are a few people out there who think cryptocurrency is just one big fraudulent scam against cryptocurrency. According to Jamie Dimon, digital currency is only fit for drug dealers and murderers. He believes that Bitcoin is a scam that will blow up. The boss of America's biggest bank said that this currency would not work. He said that people could not create a currency out of thin air. He also stated that he would immediately fire anyone who invests in cryptocurrency as it is against their rules. And the person who invests in cryptocurrency is very stupid. And both of these are very dangerous. Bitcoin emerged after a financial crisis. It allows you to bypass banks and traditional payment processes, creating a bigger risk of financial loss. Financial institutions are concerned about Bitcoin's association with money laundering and online crime. After Diamond's comments, Bitcoin's value fell by 5%. He predicts anyone who is investing in this digital currency will, for a fact, lose their stakes. In short, the cons are, number one, America's biggest bank does not believe cryptocurrency will be a success. Number two, it bypasses banks and traditional ways of payment, creating a bigger risk for financial loss. Number three, it was previously associated with money laundering and online crime. These arguments come from a very personal view on both sides. But will anybody ever be able to predict the outcome of a situation 100% to the mark? Cryptocurrency is new to the world and is at war with fiat money. Central banks are keen on preserving their monopoly on paper money, and they will not give up without a fight. This has been Blockchain. Uncovering blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, and the future of money. Blockchain and cryptocurrency exposed. Blockchain and cryptocurrency as the future of money, book one. Written by Alan Wright, narrated by Scott Miller. Copyright 2017 by Alan Wright. Production copyright 2017 by Alan Wright. Cryptocurrency. How to Make a Lot of Money, Investing, and Trading in Cryptocurrency Unlocking the Lucrative World of Cryptocurrency Cryptocurrency, Investing and Trading, Book 1 Written by Andrew Johnson Narrated by Nikki Gallo Description If you had purchased $100 worth of Bitcoins in the middle of 2009, then you would have ended up with 2,000 of them and really only been able to use them to buy drugs on the dark net. If you had held on to these coins until August 2017, you would have turned that $100 into more than $8 million. While the Bitcoin ship might have already sailed, it is not too late to jump onto the cryptocurrency bandwagon and make a profit in the process. If you are wondering about how to go about doing just that, then Cryptocurrency, How to Make a Lot of Money Investing and Trading in Cryptocurrency is the book you have been waiting for. Currently, only about 25% of Americans actually understand what cryptocurrency is, and only about 2% use them on a regular basis. Despite this fact, all of the more than 1,000 cryptocurrencies on the market today have a market valuation of more than $60 billion dollars. 
Regardless of what you know about cryptocurrency as a whole, it is clear that this market is something to watch. Inside, you will learn everything you wanted to know about the technology that powers cryptocurrency and how to tell a Bitcoin from a Litecoin from an Ether and why that distinction matters. You will also learn how to choose the most promising contenders for the next big thing and not lose your shirt while taking advantage of the high degree of volatility that the market is currently experiencing. Top analysts are already calling cryptocurrency the most important technological advancement since the Internet, and before the market settles down, fortunes will most assuredly be won and lost several times over. So, what are you waiting for? Don't let this unique moment in human history pass you by. Take control of your finances and buy this book today. Introduction Congratulations on downloading Cryptocurrency, How to Make a Lot of Money Investing and Trading in Cryptocurrency, and thank you for doing so. Cryptocurrency is an increasingly relevant investment concern, and, even if you only have a vague idea of what it is all about at the moment, with a little bit of study, you will soon find that there is significant profit to be made in that arena. That doesn't mean that profit will be easy to acquire, however, which is why the following chapters will discuss everything you need to know in order to start investing in cryptocurrency in the most effective and reliable way possible. First, you will learn all about blockchain, the foundational technology in play behind all the major cryptocurrencies currently on the market, and just what it is about this technology that is causing experts to say it is the most important technology advancement since the creation of the Internet. Next, you will learn all about the details of cryptocurrency itself and why you are sure to hear more about them in the immediate future. From there, you will learn all about the ins and outs of investing in cryptocurrency in such a way that minimizes risk as much as possible, while at the same time maximizing your potential for profit. You will learn then about tips for investing in cryptocurrency successfully along with avoiding fraud while doing so. You will also learn about the other major way to make money via cryptocurrency, which is known as cryptocurrency mining. Finally, you will learn about where cryptocurrency is likely to go in the future. There are plenty of books on this subject on the market. Thanks for choosing this one. Every effort was made to ensure it is full of as much useful information as possible. Please enjoy. Chapter 1. Understanding Blockchain, the Building Block of Cryptocurrency Cryptocurrencies of one type or another are all the rage these days, despite the fact that approximately 75% of all Americans can't actually describe what a cryptocurrency is. Cryptocurrencies are a type of digital currency that can be put into use in an increasingly number of ways from paying for groceries to making long-term investments. Their use, and even their very existence, came about thanks to the technology known as blockchain. While the use of the term blockchain can vary, depending on if the conversation in question is discussing cryptocurrency in general, smart contracts, or bitcoins, the main takeaway from the conversation is going to be that blockchain technology allows for the storage of large amounts of mostly financial data in a decentralized database. You may find it helpful to think of blockchain as you would Legos, in that each blockchain is made up of a wide variety of blocks that can be assembled in different ways, while still falling under the same general brand. More specifically, each blockchain stores data in such a way that it allows for an unparalleled combination of accessibility and security that is extremely difficult to crack due to its very nature. Each block in a given blockchain contains all of the data from the preceding blocks, while also adding its own unique information to the mix. Each time a new block is added to a chain from an established node, that information is then automatically added to all of the other nodes that are connected to that chain after it has been verified for accuracy. In addition to storing a vast swath of data, 
Every block also automatically timestamps the transactions, and it adds to the chain along with including other types of identifying data as well, which makes it easy for the blockchain to determine its unique spot in the line of blocks. This fact makes it easy for every blockchain to operate without any centralized control or authority directing it, or any primary server that oversees the process to make sure everything works the way it should. Instead, these types of processes all take place automatically spread throughout the various nodes that are connected directly to the blockchain in question. As such, a single blockchain could easily be spread out across the entire world based on nodes that are all operating more or less autonomously. These nodes then have the ability to communicate with one another securely through an advanced system that utilizes a form of specifically designed cryptography, along with digital signals that are in place to ensure the integrity of the chain at all times. Each block allows for both read-only and writable access depending on the authorization level of its users. Users that have read-only access are able to view the chain and its related transactions, while writable users are allowed to add new blocks to the chain. Blockchain security is unique in that it doesn't work to actively prevent corruption from reaching the chain. Instead, it relies on its unique nature to thwart those who have nefarious plans for the data encoded within. Altering the data contained within a blockchain would require extreme computational power that is generally not feasible or economical for reasons that are outlined in detail below. Innocuous Beginnings The root of blockchain technology can be traced all the way back to the 1980s when it was invented as a way to prevent spammers from sending out mass emails. The idea was that in order to send an email, the sender's computer would have to complete a basic calculation that would become increasingly more complex the more emails that are sent at once. This technology never saw widespread use and more or less lay fallow until 2008. At this point, discussion on a peer-to-peer -peer programming forum turned to the ways at which the technology could be used as a way to facilitate P2P financial transactions that had no ties to the traditional banking infrastructure. This was a purely theoretical conversation at the time but it didn't remain that way for long. At the start of 2009, a treatise entitled Bitcoin, a P2P electronic cash system, started making the rounds on the same forum authored by a person or a group of people using the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. At about the same time, this alias released the basic code of what would go on to form the basis of what would become the Bitcoin infrastructure releasing the first round of bitcoins as a proof of concept. A number of other programmers quickly went on to improve the code, and the Nakamoto alias dropped off the map in early 2010. To more accurately understand blockchain, it is helpful to understand how bitcoin and the majority of the other cryptocurrencies on the market today actually work. Bitcoin is a type of digital currency that, in general, works the same way that other digital services, such as PayPal, do, though there are a few notable differences as well. It allows users to transfer Bitcoins from person to person, with each Bitcoin having a value that allows it to be exchanged for hard currency, depending on its currently agreed-upon value. Each of these transactions is then recorded and verified in the Bitcoin blockchain, which can then be viewed by anyone with the right software and a mind to do so. Each transaction is verified by individuals, referred to as Bitcoin miners, through the use of specialized hardware which completes the proof-of-work equation required to ensure that the transaction is authentic before new blocks are created. The miners are then paid for their time and electricity usage in fractions of bitcoins for each transaction that they verify. Bitcoins gain their value based on a global exchange rate at a given point in time, based in part on how many bitcoins are currently on the market. Between July 2010 and August 2010, the price of bitcoin has jumped more than $1,000 to sit at nearly $4,500. For reference, when the Nakamoto alias created the Genesis block for the Bitcoin platform and released the first round of Bitcoins, 
One user then used 10,000 bitcoins to order a pair of large pizzas, which put the initial value of a bitcoin at about 0.002 cents. By 2014, bitcoin, on the back of the blockchain technology that powered it, was catching on in the mainstream. When bitcoin hit $1,000 in value for the first time, coders working on its infrastructure made a game-changing breakthrough. They discovered an easy way to add entire programs to individual blocks, creating the first smart contracts. The cryptocurrency, Ethereum, discussed in detail later on in this book, has taken the smart contract concept and run with it, creating an entire platform based around this aspect of the blockchain technology. Component of a blockchain Decentralized database the biggest difference between a traditional database and a blockchain database lies in the degree of centralization that is required for the database to function properly. In a standard database, data nodes and the servers that run them are split up based on physical space limitations but still kept as close to one another as possible as a means of reducing latency. On the other hand, Decentralized databases, such as those used in the blockchain database, are made up of nodes that have no physical limitations, which means they can be spread out as much as the needs of their users require. This fact, when combined with blockchain's ability to self-sort components and its inherent tamper-proof nature, means that it is largely autonomous in addition to being extremely safe. Blockchain more or less allows the currency to move in the same way that the Internet transfers information. Security Measures Perhaps the unique thing about blockchain technology is the security measures inherent in its cryptography. This security is a function of its decentralized nature in addition to being required because of it. It works based on the fact that each blockchain contains all the information from the blocks that came before it. In order for a new block to be added to the chain, all of its information needs to be verified by nodes that are currently active around the world by comparing all of its information to that which came before it. Unless the information in the new block matches the data that is stored in at least 51% of all active nodes, the new block will not be added to the existing blockchain. This means that in order for someone with malicious intent to submit a block with false information, they would need to coordinate a scenario where enough false nodes were created that they totaled more than half of all the nodes running the blockchain at one time. Data There are two types of data stored in each block of the blockchain, the data related to the block itself and the data containing all of its transactions. The data related to relevant transactions takes up most of the space, and once it is verified, it moves throughout all of the nodes of the blockchain through a process known as the best effort model. This model allows information to be transferred to the closest nodes first, before spreading outward from node to node without the need for any controlling force. Proof of Work Every time a new round of transactions is added to a node, that node is then verified against the blockchain's official timeline before being added to its place in the chain. Once this has taken place, the chain will then automatically log the relevant data and verify its proof-of-work system as a means of ensuring that the block was created via authorized means as opposed to outside forces. This proof-of-work requires a large amount of computational power in order to be completed successfully, which is why miners are required and why they use specialized machines for the process. The more information a block requires, the more complicated its proof of work will be in order for it to be verified. This is another reason why it is so difficult and costly to hack a blockchain. Hashes Another facet of blockchain security revolves around what are known as hashes, which ensure that even if someone broke into a blockchain, they wouldn't be able to take advantage of what they saw and would instead see what is known as a fixed-length output, which is similar to a digital fingerprint. Changing so much as a single digit of a hash code then alters the data in ways that are impossible to predict. The most common type of hash function that is used by a majority of available cryptocurrencies is what is known as SHA-256. 
The end result is that the data provided in this format can only be decoded by programs using the same program to decode it and make sure it is usable in a more traditional sense. When a block is verified, it receives its own hash coded prior to being added to the chain. Each individual transaction is also given its own unique one as well. This starter hash is then modified even further based on the details relating to a block's specific location in the chain and the relation its data has to the block surrounding it. If the details of the block's hash don't match what they should when it reaches a new node, the block will be removed from the chain. Merkle Trees Merkle trees are a key part of not only how details are stored in the blockchain, but also how they are accessed and verified relatively quickly. While blockchains can be built without them, those that don't take advantage of this technology are more difficult to access and tend to be less effective overall. As previously noted, each block contains numerous new transactions, and each of these have their own hash code. The transactional hashes are then combined and put through an additional hacking process as they are added to the blockchain, which causes another unique hash to be created as a result. These hashes then continue to combine and multiply, getting larger and larger as they go until a single unique hash represents the blockchain as a whole. This fully completed hash is referred to as a root hash, which is then used to the benefit of the Merkle tree sometimes known as the Merkle chain. This chain can be thought of as the sum total of all various hashes that are a part of it. The Merkle tree is then used as a means of additional security and also allows for the system to accurately determine when any of the hashes are altered. Each hash is then checked for accuracy each time an additional node is added to the chain. Merkle trees are essentially what is known as a functionality matrix that allows each node to verify the current chain as effectively as possible. They also allow finances to be compacted into easily digested information that makes it easier for users to follow the flow of an individual transaction without needing to dig too deeply into all of the specifics. Each Merkle tree starts with a pair of branches that split off into factors of two. These branches then also split, and so on and so forth, allowing for an even distribution of data verification. They are also useful when it comes to encoding a variety of file types that are smaller than the original file. Merkle trees handle data verification in a fashion that is crucial to ensuring that a blockchain functions properly by allowing for the same information to exist in multiple places at the same time without having to worry about running the risk of corruption of accurate data just because some negligent data reaches the blockchain. This is what allows for the fact that data needs to be changed across a majority of nodes before it will be accepted by the blockchain as a whole. The sheer amount of data that is stored in a blockchain means that checking each new block manually would be an extremely time-consuming process, which is another reason that Merkle trees come in handy. They also make it easier to limit the amount of information that needs to be shared across all the relevant nodes at any given time, which allows for each node to locate and determine disparities as quickly as possible by determining what the correct information actually is. Each time a hash makes a match, it is flagged before the next branch is checked as a means of ensuring that everything matches up in a way of deciding the extent of the deviated information. This entire process takes much less time than it would if all of the data had to be individually checked each time a new block is added to the chain. Rather than rechecking all of the information each time a new block is added to the whole, the hashes are simply verified and the Merkle tree moves on to the next block. Merkle trees require trust in order to function properly. Specifically, users must trust in the viability and sanctity of the blockchain as a whole. Thus, when a user decides to generate a new node, they can have faith that the version of the blockchain they are downloading is going to be the most recent version of the chain, and also the most accurate. Any nodes that are generated by untrustworthy sources can then be easily checked against the primary hash. After everything has been approved and the download verified, it can then continue as normal. If the information generated by multiple nodes is proven to be inaccurate, they are then thrown out and the chain reverts back to the last version that was correctly verified. 
While Merkle trees are generally used as a means to check for deviations in data structures and nodes, they are also gaining popularity when it comes to verifying similarities in the database and servers as well. Every website that relies on having servers that act as quickly as possible could benefit from this technology as it would allow their users to access information and connect to servers in a way that is as hassle-free as possible. If the database is then tampered with, the hashes will change and the Merkle tree process will take note of these changes and set things right relatively quickly. This then stops any potential threats from taking root on a site before any of the malicious changes are permanent. Chapter 2 Cryptocurrency Basics For thousands of years, prior to the existence of society as we know it today, the currency was essentially anything that was on hand and readily available. Barter was the way of the world, and trade occurred whenever two people could come to an agreement on an even exchange between pigs and chickens, or what have you. Slowly but surely, urbanization began to occur, and, as individuals started to have fewer cows and chickens on hand, currencies began to take their place and made it easier for folks from varying regions to trade with one another with ease. The eventual creation of the Internet essentially destroyed any barriers between worldwide commerce as individuals could trade money for objects from one side of the globe to the other. After this most recent expansion of scope, denizens of the Internet decided that the time was ripe for a purely digital medium of exchange, and thus, cryptocurrencies were born. A cryptocurrency is any digital currency that is based on computer code and relies exclusively on the market to determine how new units are created and what the value of the currency is, as opposed to relying on hard assets like more traditional currencies. As an alternative to these currencies, cryptocurrencies have proven to be surprisingly viable over the past decade. They offer value in a purely digital fashion when it comes to tracking and issuing currency, all within a purely digital space. Cryptocurrencies offer an autonomous means of tracking and control their units of currency in a self-contained sphere of influence without the need for a traditional governing body in any shape or form. Bitcoin is currently the most famous example of this phenomena, though there are more than 1,000 types of cryptocurrency currently floating around on the Internet and the Darknet. Each of these cryptocurrencies have unique strengths and weaknesses, and it is generally only considered a matter of time before an upstart dethrones Bitcoin as the modern face of cryptocurrencies. This is practically a given, as each new cryptocurrency that comes into existence is built upon Bitcoin's strengths, with steps taken to minimize their weaknesses. Current contenders to watch include Ether, the Ethereum currency which is primarily used as a way of paying for digital services and fueling digital machines, which work on the back of smart contracts. The other major contender is Litecoin which offers confirmation times that are much faster than bitcoins when it comes to verifying transactions. While more standard currencies are limited based on external values when it comes to how much they could be worth, cryptocurrencies run the gauntlet from one cent all the way up to bitcoins $4,000 plus valuation. There are two main forms of cryptocurrency, those that are controlled by a centralized source, and those such as bitcoin, that are at the complete and total whim of the market. Decentralized cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin tend to utilize a wide variety of different verification methods when it comes to making sure that transactions get to where they need to be and are verified and added to the appropriate blockchain in the process. This is commonly done through the proof-of-work model, though there are other viable options such as consensus platforms and consensus protocols as well. How Cryptocurrency is Priced As there are no governing bodies watching over cryptocurrency prices, it falls to each cryptocurrency to maintain its price using different means. The price of a particular cryptocurrency is a reflection of the value that the market assigns to it, which means that at its core, it is still a reflection of supply and demand, though arguably in a purer form than more traditional currencies. External factors are also known to play a bigger role in cryptocurrencies than the traditional currencies, 
purely because there are fewer filters between them and the market forces that drive them. Those who spend their type trading in cryptocurrencies generally have a measurable role in the determination of price, especially among cryptocurrencies that are less well known to the general public, or at least the small percentage of the public that is aware of the cryptocurrency in the first place. These traders operate just like any other trader, in that they purchase a given cryptocurrency, hold it until they can make a profit, and then sell it off again to someone else who is interested in repeating the process. If enough traders purchase and hold on to a given cryptocurrency, then they can conspire to inflate the price to levels that are higher than what the demand would otherwise dictate. While it is sometimes positive, if you happen to be holding on to the currency, outside influences can also be negative, driving the price of a specific cryptocurrency down regardless of what the market demand might otherwise dictate. If this occurs, the creator of the currency have frequently been seen to step in in the past and attempt to use other external forces as a means of cutting off these downward trends. Some of the ways they do so are discussed here. Coverage in the Media Regardless of the type of media that is used, coverage in the media is one of the primary means by which the price of a given cryptocurrency is manipulated by outside forces, as it gives those who are only aware of the cryptocurrency in a general sense something to focus all of their energy on. This artificially generated public interest then leads to an increase in price as investors rush to jump onto the next big thing. The media often perks up when a new cryptocurrency begins showing up on the major cryptocurrency exchanges, or if an option that has already previously been mentioned receives a major update to its code. Additional media-worthy events include facts that can be succinctly summed up by sound bites, or anything that proves it is a market that is growing in community involvement and overall popularity. Regardless of the context, Media coverage is likely to increase the price of the cryptocurrency that receives the coverage. General Opinions The Internet is naturally divided into subgroups that are all intensely devoted to a specific thing. This goes for every type of cryptocurrency, no matter how obscure it is to the wider world, and these individuals can be thought of as the cryptocurrency's vanguard when it comes to convincing the wider world that they are using a viable platform. These subgroups can be a powerful force when it comes to artificially inflating the price of their chosen cryptocurrency, because the more they can get their message out there, the more likely it will be that other people will bite and invest money into it. Furthermore, these vanguards also provide valuable feedback to developers, work on the code that supports the cryptocurrency themselves, and invest their own money into it, each of which helps drive the price higher. The clearest example of this type of scenario occurred during the initial Bitcoin bubble in 2014. At this point, Bitcoin had slowly been growing in value for about five years before suddenly hitting a tipping point in its user base. Once this occurred, the price of something that had previously been worth less than a dollar rapidly increased until the price was greater than $1,000. As a result of this increase, Serious investors started taking notice for the first time, and the price has largely been on a positive trajectory ever since. Animated Bots Just like with any other currency, liquidity is a crucial part of a cryptocurrency's growth. After all, if there isn't any available currency to trade, the public interest will drop off, and the price will dip as a result. Unlike with hard currencies, if a specific cryptocurrency isn't growing at a rate that its creators appreciate, they can deploy bots to get in on the trading action and artificially inflate the amount of liquidity available, thus ensuring things continue moving in the desired direction. Liquidity relates to the amount of a given asset that is currently available to trade. And if it is low, then those looking to trade in a specific cryptocurrency won't have any means of purchasing it. To counter this fact, Automated bots are employed as a means to sell and buy the targeted cryptocurrency, stimulating growth through what are essentially simulated transactions, which often cause additional units of the currency to be produced in response, thus improving liquidity overall. 
This is particularly prevalent in China, which has far fewer restrictions on cryptocurrency exchanges than the rest of the world. In fact, they are regularly credited with creating a large amount of liquidity that Bitcoin takes advantage of on a regular basis. Social Media Presence When it comes to traditional currencies, relevant news tends to spread through traditional means such as newspapers and targeted television programs. With cryptocurrency, however, relevant news and policy changes are far more likely to first come to light via social media. There are countless groups across all social media platforms that are dedicated to cryptocurrency trading and those who follow it religiously and these followers are typically rabid for their chosen cause. This level of enthusiasm means that it will only take a small mention of a change to a given cryptocurrency, even if it is unverified, to cause enough movement in that cryptocurrency to affect the market. This fact has generated a unique phenomenon where those with a financial interest in a particular cryptocurrency can easily spread blatantly false rumors about it as a way to make prices move in the direction they prefer, even past the point where the rumor in question is proven to be without merit. If this rumor was directly related to a price increase or decrease, then it often comes true simply based on public reaction and completely without taking into account what the market would have actually done otherwise. Pump and Dump This is a type of influencing that has been going on with traditional currencies for generations and has, unsurprisingly, made its way into cryptocurrency markets where it is frowned upon but not against the law. The pump and dump works when an individual or group of individuals purchases up as much of a given cryptocurrency as possible, thus limiting the amount available to the public at large, driving up the price as a result of the perceived shortage. Cryptocurrency exchanges operate via what are known as digital order books, which create lists of all the cryptocurrency trades made each day. If those books end up being light on sellers and heavy on buyers, the price changes as a result. After the price has increased in proportion to the amount of scarcity that has been created, those who initiated the pump and dump sell off all their cryptocurrency that they purchased, achieving a significant windfall in the process. This part of the process then sends the price into the dumpster as the demand will suddenly and dramatically decrease when compared to the supply. Common Cryptocurrency Considerations while well, Bitcoin is without a doubt the most commonly discussed cryptocurrency these days, it is a long way from the only game in town. The following list outlines the details of several different cryptocurrencies that are also worth keeping an eye on. Keep in mind that this is only a brief overview, however. The specifics described here are always in flux and new, and it is impossible to say when a new potentially game-changing cryptocurrency may appear on the market. All of the cryptocurrencies discussed here can be purchased on any reputable cryptocurrency exchange. Ether The biggest contender for the crown these days is the Ethereum currency known as Ether. Ether is mostly used between individuals to fund services, primarily those that are based on smart contracts. It is also used to provide what is known as gas for virtual machines that have become something of an Ethereum hallmark. This gas covers the operating costs of the individual systems as well as the system as a whole. Approximately 18 million Ether is created each year. Ether is especially worth keeping an eye on as by the end of 2017 it will switch from proof-of-work validation to what is known as proof-of-stake validation system. This means instead of assigning validation services to a random assortment of miners, those with a stake in the transaction in question will have the opportunity to verify the transaction. Blocks will then be forged instead of mined, and forgers will receive transaction fees for their work, but will not be paid an additional stipend in the traditional sense. Furthermore, in early 2017, numerous research groups, along with Fortune 500 companies and various blockchain startup companies, all got together, more than 100 in all, to form the nonprofit organization known as the Ethereum Alliance, 
whose purpose is to create a standard for the open source version of the Ethereum blockchain, along with a private version that will specifically address the needs of professional industries, including healthcare and banking, in a more focused way. With the Ethereum blockchain, smart contracts are stored on every node in a public fashion, which means it can sometimes be difficult for nodes to calculate so much data, with the end result being lower verification speeds. The Ethereum is currently capable of processing approximately 25 transactions each second, though great scalability is said to be possible. As of July 2017, one Ether is worth approximately $200. Litecoin Litecoin is the cryptocurrency that currently bears the greatest similarity to Bitcoin, but with a few important improvements thrown in for good measure. It can process far more transactions in a shorter period of time than Bitcoin can, which prevents many of the bottlenecks that the Bitcoin network frequently experiences. In fact, it can process approximately five times as many blocks as blockchain in the same period of time. The downside is its methods tend to lead to more orphan blocks, but at the same time, it has less of a chance of leading to a double spending scenario where the same coins are spent twice while the nodes catch up. Furthermore, it also requires significantly less processing power to verify a Litecoin than it does a Bitcoin. It also offers very low payment costs and completes payments approximately four times faster than Bitcoin does. The Litecoin network is working to produce as many as 84 million Litecoins, which dwarfs the number of Bitcoins on the market nearly 4 to 1. In July 2017, one Litecoin was worth approximately $42. Doggycoin While first introduced as a joke on the concept of cryptocurrency, which is why its logo features a picture of the Shiba Inu dog made popular by the 2013 meme, it has since gone on to be one of the most high-profile forms of cryptocurrency outside of Bitcoin. In fact, a crowdfunding campaign was successfully funded to send a solid gold doggy coin to the moon in 2019. In its first month of existence in 2013, it reached a capitalization of over $60 million. It is also different than many other cryptocurrencies, as it has a production schedule of 5.26 billion coins produced per year. It is most commonly used as a way for social media users to tip one another on particularly interesting posts. Doggy Coin also offers a very fast one-minute processing time and has no limit on the number that can ultimately be generated. It was worth approximately $1,250 in July of 2017. Chapter 3. Getting Started Investing in Cryptocurrency 2016 saw dramatic growth in the capitalization of cryptocurrencies of all shapes and sizes, which makes them attractive to a wide swath of the investment market. Once again, Bitcoin remains the reigning champ, both as the most stable cryptocurrency on the market and the one that showed the greatest overall increase in 2016 at 300%. This doesn't mean that investing in cryptocurrencies is without risk, however, which is why it is important to keep in mind the pros and cons outlined below before making any serious investments into this rapidly changing market. Benefits Decreased Chance of Fraud Due to the fact that cryptocurrencies are all digital, it makes it much more difficult for traditional types of fraud to occur around them. They cannot be counterfeited or forged, and it is impossible for one person in the transaction to sneakily reverse it once it has gone through. Protection Against Identity Theft After you have purchased a cryptocurrency, you don't need to worry about identity theft the way you would when you are dealing with more traditional exchanges. This is a serious concern when it comes to typical exchanges, as each new transaction brings along additional charges to your debit or credit card, which, in turn, means that there are always new opportunities for thieves to do something nefarious. Extreme Access Currently, there are 3 billion people in the world who have access to the Internet, but do not have regular access to any form of exchange. 
This leaves the cryptocurrency market with a lot of room to maneuver, and it is expected to see significant growth as it gains wider acceptance. This means that an increasing amount of business is going to take place purely through digital currencies, which means those who invest in cryptocurrency now aren't just likely to see an increase, they are likely to see a dramatic increase. For example, as of 2017, 50% of all Kenyans now own a Bitcoin wallet, while less than 40% have access to reliably clean water, and only 30% have modern plumbing. Less Cost Despite the fact that every cryptocurrency transaction comes with an accompanying transaction fee, the fees for utilizing a cryptocurrency exchange are almost always going to be lower than what the traders who use more traditional exchanges pay on a regular basis. Negatives Future is uncertain. Despite the fact that Bitcoin has proved to be a winning investment for at least three years, cryptocurrency markets as a whole are still extremely new and all the risks associated with them are extremely ill-defined when compared to traditional markets. This means that, while profits are currently quite frequently higher than other markets, there are no guarantees that these trends will persist or when the bottom might fall out on the market. There simply isn't the data required to determine where they are likely to be in six months, much less a year or five years from now, which means the potential for loss is essentially limitless. Until the market stabilizes in the long term, there is no way of telling if each dollar you put into the cryptocurrency market will be worth more next year than it is today. High Volatility Despite the fact that Bitcoin is the most stable of all the 1,000 plus cryptocurrencies, it is still more than five times as volatile as gold and more than six times as volatile as the S&P 5000. While volatility means a greater chance at profit, it also means that the chance that a catastrophic loss might wipe out the market is very real. Additionally, roughly 80% of all cryptocurrency transactions are speculative as of 2017, with buyers simply buying it up and waiting for a price increase, which means the bubble has yet to burst eventually. Purely Digital While cryptocurrency's digital nature is widely seen as one of its biggest benefits, the fact that there isn't anything in the real world backing it up means it has its downsides as well. All of the details regarding every cryptocurrency exchange on the planet only exists on hard drives and modern hard drives, which are in no way infallible. If the exchange you decide to utilize experiences technical issues, then there is no way to be sure that your investment might not simply disappear, leaving you with few options when it comes to recouping funds. The sheer potential for profits if a hacker does manage to break into the exchange means they are constantly looking for security weaknesses to exploit, which means they are occasionally going to be successful. As an example, Ethereum has seen numerous attacks over the years, one of which was so successful that an entirely new chain had to be constructed in order to repair the damage. Those that chose not to migrate their accounts are now trading on Ethereum Classic. Splits like this would literally never happen in the real world and goes to show just how unpredictable things can get if you choose to trade in uncharted waters. Cryptocurrency Trading Trading cryptocurrencies can be an extremely profitable investment approach regardless of how familiar you are with the ins and outs of securities trading. One of the best things about trading in cryptocurrency is that there is practically no barrier to entry. To get started, all you need to do is find an exchange that seems legitimate based on a reasonable amount of research and then go ahead and make your first trade. If you are already a proud owner of an amount of cryptocurrency you are hoping to trade, then in many cases your account won't even need to be verified. Another great thing about trading in cryptocurrency is that the market is frequently extremely fragmented, which leads to larger spreads than you would generally see anywhere else. Due to the fact that cryptocurrency exchanges are not officially regulated by anyone, they also offer the ability to trade with extremely large margins in place, which means a small investment can become a large return there practically faster than anywhere else. The same goes for losses, however, so caution is suggested. To add in another layer of complexity, no two exchanges are connected, which means each is free to change prices based on their own levels of supply and demand. 
This, in turn, leads to opportunities for arbitrage, as you can often pick up a currency on one exchange and sell it on another immediately and still turn a profit. Furthermore, due to the fact that Bitcoin is still considered the cryptocurrency standard, many of the cryptocurrencies on the market have followed its lead when it comes to creating and sustaining price bubbles, which are supported by outside influences as discussed in the previous chapter. While this won't be good for those who waited until the bubble was in place to buy in, those who got in before the current boom cycle will stand to make a pretty penny, as long as they get out while the getting is good. The most common means for trading cryptocurrencies through trading companies is via what is known as a contract for differences, a CFD. With these types of contracts, a buyer and seller make an agreement, and when the agreement expires, the buyers will pay the seller the difference in price from when the contract was agreed upon to the current moment, assuming this ends up being in a net gain. If the price decreases during that time, then the seller owes the difference to the buyer instead. As far as leverage is concerned, rates of as much as 20 to 1 are not uncommon, which means that a $1 investment can net you $20 per each dollar the price increases per unit that you purchase of the cryptocurrency in question. While this means the potential for making a profit is extremely robust, the potential for loss is equally strong which means you are going to want to be very aware of your odds of success before taking on any leveraged trades. Additional Benefits Global Currencies Traditional currencies are fairly limited when it comes to external factors that affect their price. This is not the case with cryptocurrencies, however, as anything serious that happens anywhere in the world has the potential to impact price movement based on how investors respond to the news. As an example, Bitcoin has seen significant price movements based on everything from the implementation of new capital controls in Greece to the Chinese devaluing of the yuan. Events such as these have actually caused many of Bitcoin's largest swings in price throughout the years, both positive and negative. The market never closes. Blowing even the Forex market, which is open 120 hours per week out of the water, the cryptocurrency markets are open 24-7, 365 days of the year. Additionally, there are currently more than 100 different cryptocurrency exchanges that see a large amount of usage, and they all offer various levels of trading and different rates, which means it shouldn't be hard to find the one that is right for you and your trading or investment goals. These two factors also affect volatility, as any event anywhere, at any time, can cause an immediate response among cryptocurrency investors. Swings of greater than 5% in a single day are relatively common amongst the major cryptocurrencies, and the smaller cryptocurrencies have been known to swing as much as 15% in a single day. Finding the Right Exchange Prior to putting your money into a specific exchange, it is extremely important to do your homework as a means of preventing yourself from ending up in a position where your exchange of choice simply calls it a day and packs up shop, taking your money with them. Remember, if this does occur, you are unlikely to have any real recourse of any kind, which means you are going to want to do your best to make a wise choice right from the beginning. Consider Transparency one of the most important things you will need to consider is the level of transparency the exchange you are looking at operates under. You should be able to freely take a look at their order book in addition to general information about where their funds are kept and how they verify their reserve currency. If this type of information is not readily available, then the exchange simply might not have the means to do so, or it may be much worse than that. Exchanges that don't make their details public are often what is known as fractional exchanges, which means that they do not keep enough cryptocurrency on hand to cover all of their debts, which means they are likely to fold if there is ever a run on the cryptocurrency that they focus on, as they will be unable to fill all the requests. Security Level It is important to always take into account the level of security that your chosen exchange operates under. The bare minimum level of security required is a basic online security protocol, which means that its URL will have an HTTPS in it rather than an HTTP. 
A secure protocol allows for a greatly decreased risk of a personal information leak, which means there is less of a chance for your account to be stolen. Additionally, you are going to want to go above and beyond and ensure that the one you choose has a two-factor identification process as well as secure login practices. If you commit to an exchange with less than this, then all you are doing is opening yourself up to the possibility of identity theft. Be aware of fees. Regardless of the type of cryptocurrency you are buying into, you will need to pay a transaction fee to the person who verifies it for you. While technically most of these transaction fees are voluntary, if you elect not to pay them, then cryptocurrency miners have a much less impressive incentive to taking and verifying your block, which means you will have to wait longer for your money to appear if you do so. A majority of the exchanges in the world, outside of China, then charge a secondary fee on top of the transaction fee as a way for the exchange to turn a profit. These secondary fees can add up quickly if you aren't careful, which is why it is important to know what's up before you commit to a specific exchange. Local is better. While there are cryptocurrency exchanges all over the world, you are going to want to prioritize those in your own country for the best results. First and foremost, this will make it easier for you to take advantage of local periods of heavier trading simply because you are more likely to be awake when they occur. Furthermore, you are going to be more likely to be able to get the help that you can understand if something goes wrong and you need to contact customer support. Even better, depending on your country and its regulations, you may even be able to accept some semblance of recourse should the worst happen and the exchange folds, which means you will at least stand a chance of getting your money back. There is still no guarantee on this front, however, so be sure to read up on local regulations rather than blindly putting your faith in the system. Additionally, it is important to keep in mind that just because you choose a local exchange doesn't necessarily mean they are going to be dealing in the currencies that you hope they might. USD is still the most common currency for these exchanges to deal in, which means if you are looking for another primary currency, you may need to look a little harder for the exchange that deals in it. Know how long the transactions will take. Due to the fact that all cryptocurrency transactions require verification before they go through, exchange transactions tend to work on a lead time that gives this process time to occur. It is important that you take the time to read up on the amount of time that your chosen exchange takes to do such things in order to be aware of how long it'll take to actually get the cryptocurrency of your choice before you pull the trigger. Regardless of the lag time, you are going to want to choose an exchange that locks in rates when the trade is initiated rather than when it goes through. Otherwise, you will often find yourself potentially making less than you would have otherwise, simply due to the transaction time required. This will also ensure that you don't miss out on a profitable trade because things were lagging. Popular Exchanges Kraken This exchange is one of the top 15 in the USD market in addition to being the most popular of the Euro-friendly exchanges. So much so that it clears more Euro volume than any other currently active cryptocurrency exchange. Coinbase this is the oldest continuously active cryptocurrency exchange currently active in the United States. It is closely regulated and is still in the top five when it comes to volume of cryptocurrency exchanged per day. OKCoin okay This is a Chinese exchange, which means it is far less regulated than the other options on the list. The only reason it makes it on the list at all is because it primarily deals in USD. Bitstamp this is another one of the oldest continuously operating cryptocurrency exchanges on the market today. It was first started in 2011 and is still the second most commonly used, exchanging more than 10,000 units of currency each and every day. Bitfinex This is the most popular exchange on the market today, with users all over the world trading nearly 200,000 units of currency each week. If you are already in possession of cryptocurrency, then you can get started trading with Bitfinex without having to deal with any amount of external verification. ICOs Initial coin offerings, or ICOs, are an increasingly common occurrence. 
In 2017, a new cryptocurrency known as Bancor managed to raise $153 million in a matter of hours, and another known as Status.im, raising nearly $70 million in that same period of time. Overall, in 2017 alone, this process has raised nearly half a billion dollars for a variety of cryptocurrencies. While the name comes from the more commonly known initial public offering, ICOs are significantly different in nearly every way. In general, an ICO is a type of crowdfunding strategy that businesses that are based on blockchain technology can implement as a means of funding their business plans. Investors are provided with the opportunity to buy into the cryptocurrency that the company is creating at a fixed rate before it hits the general market. These early investors are essentially betting that the resulting cryptocurrency or application that is being created is going to be popular enough to warrant a high enough demand to cause the currency to rise above whatever it is they paid for it. Currently, the Ethereum platform has been the platform of choice for many of the most popular ICOs to date. While much of this funding is coming in from China, Investors from all over the world have been known to jump in on the ground floor of these ICOs, all the while hoping that they are going to catch on in a serious way. In addition to the standard warnings that go along with investing into an essentially unknown quantity, ICOs face unique issues that make them far from a reliable investment. Most importantly, there are concerns at the federal level that these companies are avoiding SEC regulations, which means their business plans are not currently held up to the same rigorous standards as IPOs. Additionally, critics are claiming that the success they have seen so far is simply part of another bubble that has yet to burst, much like the Bitcoin bubble has done several times over the last eight years. Despite these potential issues, ICOs still have the possibility to produce serious profits for early investors, as they will most assuredly see a high return on their investments if everything goes according to plan. Regardless, if you are thinking about pursuing this investment path, then you will need to keep in mind that if investing in cryptocurrency in the standard way is risky, then investing in ICOs is downright dangerous. As with all investments, it is important that you never make the mistake of investing more then you can afford to lose. As such, you are going to want to approach an ICO with an analytical mindset, which means you are going to want to start by looking at any valuable documentation that the company will provide, including a business plan. This will allow you to make sure that the project makes financial sense at the base level and that its long-term business proposition checks out. You will also need to ensure that the market has already shown an actual demand for the product or service that the company is planning to provide. Additionally, you will also want to make sure that the cryptocurrency that is being offered will end up being a vital part of the business that is being created when it is actually up and running. It is also important to remember that buying into an ICO is not the same as buying stock through a standard IPO. When you buy into an IPO, you are literally buying into a company Buying into an ICO gives you no such rights. What's more, IPOs come with certain requirements for the company in question, including fiduciary and accreditation obligations from the company. ICOs have no such requirements. With most ICOs, you will be lucky to see a website, a business plan, and a white paper, and maybe not even all three of these, as they have never yet had a product ready to show off you are risking a great deal more than with any other type of investment scenarios. It is also important to note that just because these companies are seeing a strong response at first, doesn't mean this goodwill is going to last. What's more, many venture capitalists actually believe that giving a new company so much money up front is actually detrimental to the long-term health of the company, as those in charge often feel compelled to spend what they have without feeling the need to work as hard as possible to create a product that people will actually want. Finally, the fact that a majority of these companies are creating products based on the Ethereum platform should be a cause for concern as well, simply because it is just another cryptocurrency platform, albeit one that those in the know believe has a better chance than most of making it in the long term. This is still just conjecture, however, and there is nothing to prevent the Ethereum platform from experiencing a series of flash crashes and vanishing within six months. After all, it is still very much experimental, 
and thus immature technology. All told, ICOs are very risky, but potentially a profitable venture, which means it might be in your best interest to wait until some of the current ICO companies actually pan out before getting involved in the process directly. Chapter 4. Investing in Cryptocurrency. Tips for Success. Understanding Investment. Investing successfully is all about working smarter as opposed to harder. Rather than working long hours and sacrificing personal happiness to sock money away in a savings account, it is about taking that money and using it to potentially build a better life in the long run through a maximization of profits earned. Investing successfully is also about setting priorities for your money and the returns it will generate. Spending is easy to do and provides instant gratification and short-term satisfaction. On the other hand, investing is all about delayed gratification and making life better in the long term. Increased Returns One of the most important aspects of investing is what is known as compounding, which is the process of generating larger returns in the long term by reinvesting initial returns both early and often. In order for it to work out in your favor, it requires both time and initial earnings for you to reinvest. If given enough of both factors, compounding can help an initial investment grow exponentially over time. If you are lucky enough to still be 20 or more years away from retirement, then compounding should be thought of as the most important investment tool of your arsenal. For example, if you are currently 25 years old and want to save a million dollars by the time you are ready to retire at age 60, you would need to invest a little less than $900 per month assuming you were going to maintain a steady 5% return on your investments for the next 35 years. On the other hand, if you wait to start investing until you are 35, then you will need to invest about twice as much to reach the same point. Finally, if you wait 20 years and don't start investing until you are 45, then you will need to save four times as much to reach your goal. Know what type of investing suits you best. The reason that there are so many different investment strategies out there is that there is no strategy out there that is right for everyone. Each investor has different reasons for wanting to invest, different acceptable levels of risk, different metrics for success, and a different desired time frame. First and foremost, it is important that you determine the goals you have for your overall investment strategy. For some people, this will be keeping their principle intact while others are going to be willing to risk it all in order to accumulate more in the long term. Depending on your goals, you may even want to create different isolated investments to reach each of them. Regardless of what your plans are before you get started investing, it is crucial that you have a clear idea in mind about why you are doing what you are doing, as this will make it easier to determine the best way to actually getting results. You are also going to want to keep in mind that your goals will not be completed in a vacuum, which means you will need to be aware of your overall time frame as well as how much risk you are willing to take on in order to ensure that you end up with the goals that are actually achievable as opposed to useless flights of fancy. Prior to being able to accurately determine your goals, it is important to determine for yourself how much money you feel you would be all right with losing as this will make it easier to determine your overall level of risk. When deciding on this amount, it is important to keep in mind that no investment, regardless of how safe it may seem in the grand scheme of things, is without risk, and that it is this risk that ultimately leads to profit. The amount of risk you are going to be able to safely deal with is going to be, in part, about how quickly you hope to see a return on your initial investment. If you have 20 years or more of investing ahead of you, then you will be able to safely take on additional risk when compared to someone who is just a few years away from retirement. After you have determined your current level of risk aversion, you are also going to need to consider how much time you are going to want to spend micromanaging your investments. If you are looking for an investment strategy that allows you to spend relatively little time thinking about your investments, then you are going to want to move forward with what is known as a buy and hold strategy, where you would buy into one or more of the stable types of cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin, and hold on to it for a prolonged period of time in order to see reliable, if not necessarily stellar, returns. 
If you are instead looking to spend a lot of time maximizing your potential returns, then you will want to look into riskier ventures that have a greater chance of paying off big time if you watch them carefully. Next, you will need to consider how knowledgeable you are when it comes to the investments you are going to be making, as well as how comfortable you are going to be when it comes to monitoring your investments and making decisions about their future. Your investment decisions should always be based on how much time you have to dedicate to research and your overall comfort level with the investment process. Remember, it is important to be upfront with yourself when it comes to knowing what you don't know. Above all else, you are going to want to avoid being talked into investments that you have not thoroughly vetted yourself and never, no matter what, invest more than you can afford to lose, regardless of how much of a sure thing the investment might appear to be on the surface. Diversification is key. Regardless of how good a particular investment might seem up front, it is always a better idea to split your investment fund into at least two places as opposed to doubling down on just one investment. This is where creating a portfolio comes into play, and it is an important part of investing in the long term that everyone should consider regardless of their goals or experience. Diversifying will also help to protect your investments in case the cryptocurrency you are primarily interested in suddenly starts to experience serious loss. The way you should ultimately decide to distribute your money is going to be a result of your tolerance for risk, how comfortable you are with investing in general, and how much time you are willing to commit to micromanaging your investments. Know when to get out. If you are planning to invest in the long term, then inevitably your investments are going to end up taking a hit from time to time. And, as such, the value of your overall portfolio will dip. This is a natural part of the investment process, and in general, your best bet is going to be to stay the course and wait for things to turn back around. This is not always going to be the case, however, and any time your investment starts to dip, you will need to do some research and figure out exactly what happened. If the reason for the dip is more or less benign, then there is no reason to sell as long as the investment has produced reliable results so far. However, if your research reveals something larger that is taking place, then this initial loss may only be the tip of the iceberg. If this is the case, then you will want to prepare yourself to move out of the investment in such a way that maximizes your potential for profit before you end up losing your shirt. It is important to approach your potential investments in such a way that emotion doesn't enter into the equation in any way, shape, or form. If your research indicates that additional losses are forthcoming, then it will not do you any good to hold on to the investment and wish that things will turn around. If you hope to see successful results from your investments in the long term, getting attached to the investments you have made is simply not an option. Cryptocurrency Investment Tips While first getting started with investing in cryptocurrency is as easy as finding an exchange and making your first trade, investing successfully is another thing entirely. The following are a list of things you are going to need to keep in mind if you want to successfully invest in this burgeoning market in the long term. Treat cryptocurrency the way you would any other commodity. Commodities and cryptocurrencies are actually relatively similar from an investment standpoint for several reasons. First is that they are both used for more than just investment purposes. Commodities are real-world assets, such as base metals, that are used in industrial projects. Precious metals find use in the jewelry market, and cryptocurrencies are increasingly being used to power a wide variety of things thanks to smart contracts. Furthermore, both are traded through open market exchanges, such as when it comes to choosing the right cryptocurrency to invest in. You are going to want to choose the one that appears as though it is going to add value to the real world and contains multiple probable uses outside of standard P2P transactions. Usage is on the rise. When taken together as a whole, all the cryptocurrencies currently on the market have a combined cap of roughly $60 billion. To put this into perspective, Coca-Cola's market cap is about $180 billion, Boeing's is $100 billion, and Tesla's is $50 billion. What makes this number meaningful is that real-world usage has gone hand-in-hand -hand with increasing market usage, which means it is unlikely that cryptocurrencies as a whole will be going away anytime soon, regardless of how any one individual cryptocurrency might fare. 
As such, while the day-to-day -day market remains extremely volatile, as a long-term investment, cryptocurrency is looking increasingly stalwart. Additionally, despite the amount of buzz in investment circles about them, the number of people who use them regularly or are even aware of their existence is still an extremely small portion of the population as a whole. Currently, only about 2% of Americans use any type of cryptocurrency on a regular basis, and only 25% can accurately define what a Bitcoin is. Compared to their market cap, this is an extremely encouraging number that has literally nowhere to go but up, taking prices with it. These numbers are increasingly important as, regardless of which one you plan on investing in, the more people who use them on a regular basis, the more profitable they are going to be for those who invest in them. Furthermore, a steady increase in users will eventually even out the issue they currently have with generating pricing bubbles, which means the prices will be less likely to dramatically decrease at any point as well. Market Cycle The market cycle is a way of looking at the pattern that all investments eventually follow sooner or later when looked at over a long enough timeline. The market cycle starts with optimism on the positive side, switches into thrill as it continues moving upward, peaks at euphoria, and then begins to drop through anxiety, denial, fear, and depression before reaching its lowest level at panic. It then eventually begins to move upward again through depression, hope, and relief before getting back to optimism. While Bitcoin has already been through the entire cycle once, bottoming out during the 2014 crash, Virtually every other cryptocurrency on the market is still in the optimism stage, which means there is still plenty of time for those in the know to take advantage of it. If you do your investment research properly, you could easily see up to five solid years of growth before any of them reach the euphoria stage, which, coincidentally, is about how long experts anticipate it will take for cryptocurrency as a whole to reach market saturation. While it is important to keep the state of the market in mind, it is also important to realize that, much like the dot-com boom of the 90s, approximately 80% of all cryptocurrencies created between now and the point at which the market reaches the saturation point will not survive into the saturation phase. This is simply a fact on the way the market works, as they will simply not be able to survive throughout the buildup and hype that will cause many investors to throw their money at something without taking the time to assess whether or not that cryptocurrency actually does anything to increase the value of the market. Rather, they will simply focus on locating the best apparent deal and watching the price rise while more and more of their contemporaries make the same mistake. Focus on Solving Problems Regardless of how much profit a given cryptocurrency may potentially make, buying into it and sitting back to watch what happens is never going to be the most effective strategy possible. Rather, you are going to want to put in the extra time and energy to find those cryptocurrencies that legitimately solve problems that the world at large, or at least the market, is currently having a hard time coping with. The bigger the problem it solves, the more likely it is that it will be a viable long-term investment because the greater its overall value will eventually shake out to be. As a major portion of the world at large does not have easy access to the type of reliable banking that some countries take for granted, this means that cryptocurrencies offer a reliable way to fill these needs. They can provide functions such as wiring money and easy payments between individuals, and the cryptocurrencies that do this the best are going to be the ones that will survive past the saturation point. Focus on the long term. It is important that your cryptocurrency portfolio is focused exclusively on the long term. It is also important that you vary your investments in such a way that you limit your overall risk as much as possible. Additionally, it is best to limit the overall amount of cryptocurrencies that you invest into somewhere between three and five. Above all else, it is important to make a concentrated effort to control your emotions and never make rash decisions when your investments are on the line. You will also need to keep in mind that unlike with many types of long-term investments, investing in cryptocurrency brings with it no lock-in risk as they can be exchanged for other types of currency whenever you deem fit, rather than being committed to only one being traded. This means that investing in cryptocurrency is really no different than storing cash except that the potential for a return on your investment is much higher than with a traditional savings account. Be aware of Ethereum. 
While Bitcoin is the king at $4,000 per Bitcoin, it isn't really the up-and-coming type of investment you should be focusing on in hopes of returning a maximum profit. This honor currently goes to the Ethereum platform and its currency, Ether. The number of transactions on the Ethereum blockchain is about half of what Bitcoin has completed to date, despite the fact that it has been around only for a third of the time of its primary competitor. What's even more important is that unlike the transaction chart for Bitcoin, which is riddled with steep declines in price, the Ethereum chart is much more bullish overall as of summer 2017. Cryptocurrencies are inherently social constructs, which means they have robust network effects, which means that as the adoption of Ethereum continues to increase, its value and utility will do the same. It is worth keeping an eye on for a number of different reasons, the most relevant of which is the fact that the Bitcoin blockchain has already reached the peak of its usage capacity. At this point, the Bitcoin blockchain can only process about seven transactions a second, which means, at any given time, there are at least three million transactions that have been verified and are just waiting to be approved by the blockchain itself. As such, even if new transactions stopped being recorded today, it would take the blockchain five full days to catch up. The simple truth is that the basis of the Bitcoin blockchain is code that is nearly a decade old and it can't keep up with the current level of demand. This fact, coupled with the improved ease of the use of smart contracts on its platform, have led many of the leading developers in the blockchain space to switch their apps over to the Ethereum blockchain instead. Ethereum is optimized for a much higher number of transactions per second, and the fees for each of these transactions is lower as well. What it all boils down to is that experts are already predicting that Ethereum will see as much as a tenfold increase in popularity before the end of 2017. As of note in the fact that many of the applications currently under development are being developed with the focus of making the cryptocurrency process more accessible to common users and easier to understand overall, as these projects begin to come online in the next few years, it is likely that they will cause usage rates to increase even more. This, in turn, makes it a strong contender to survive past the saturation point and cause its price to increase dramatically. Even more encouraging is the fact that major corporations, including J.P. Morgan and Microsoft, have already thrown their lot in with Ethereum by joining the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Finally, the Ethereum platform is still growing and evolving with new upgrades coming down the pipeline on a regular basis. These include upcoming scalability improvements, which means it will be able to handle more than 1 million transactions a second by the end of 2017. This number is currently sitting at 14 transactions per second, so the increase is going to be quite significant. The upcoming switch to a proof-of-stake model is also due to cut down on the risk of minor centralization, 51% attacks, and combat inflation. While there will be more than one winner once cryptocurrencies reach the saturation point, Ethereum's infrastructure improvements likely mean that it will be a horse worth backing in the coming years. Chapter 5. Mining Cryptocurrency While Bitcoin, once again, holds a monopoly on the current mine share when it comes to mining, it is far from the only currency that utilizes outside help to verify its transactions. In fact, every cryptocurrency that uses a proof-of-work model uses a variation of the same process. The mining preceded is accomplished through the use of high-powered machines that generally utilize an SHA-256 double-round hash process for verification purposes in order to ensure the security and sanctity of the blockchain in question. The speed at which a given machine can validate transactions is measured in hashes per second. In exchange for your work, you will receive an amount of the currency in question that will offset your costs along with making it somewhat worth your while. Additionally, many cryptocurrencies have a transaction fee that goes to the person who mines the block that the transaction is included in as well. The greater the processing power of your mining machine, the greater your odds of completing a block and the more you will make as a result. The most common type of proof-of-work is what is known as the hash cash proof-of-work. 
and it is a type of cryptographic algorithm which makes use of a hash function as a core part of the process. Hash cache proofs can be tweaked for difficulty in order to ensure that new blocks are not generated at a faster rate than the network can handle, which means block generation is tied to the number of transactions that can be processed per second. For example, a new blockchain block cannot be created more than once every 10 minutes. The probability of a successful generation is relatively low, which means it is nearly impossible to determine which mining machine is going to generate the next block. In order for a new block to be seen as valid, its hash value must ultimately end up being less than that of the current target, which means that each block then naturally shows the work that has been done to generate it. Each block also contains the hash of the block that precedes it, which is how the chain is able to determine where in the chain it belongs. This means that a block can only be changed if the work done to all the previous blocks is also redone and new hashes are created for each of them in order. Starting Mining What constitutes the best mining hardware and the best prices for it are always in flux which means you are going to need to do some external research before you get started. You can find a breakdown of the state-of-the-art hardware that is currently being used on the Bitcoin or Reddit. And many of the latest and greatest mining machines can be found on Amazon.com or with a simple Google search. Regardless of the system you go with, you are going to need dedicated hardware to do so effectively. While you could theoretically mine using your standard computer or laptop CPU or video card, specialized machines are built for speed with this specific task in mind, which means those running them would steal any blocks you were assigned out from under you before you could even hope to finish the required calculations. Customized chips made by the ASIC company dominate the market in the summer of 2017 and typically offer speeds as much as 100 times that of what the average PC can provide. Trying to mine without this specialized hardware will generally just end up costing you more in fees for electricity than you will ever earn as a result. Specialized Bitcoin mining machines typically sell from anywhere from $500 to $3,500. Download the software. After you have purchased a mining machine, the next thing you are going to need to do is download the program that is used in the mining process. There are several different versions of this software on the market today, though the most used ones are BFG Miner and CG Miner, which run via command line commands. If you are looking for something easier and with a graphical interface, then Easy Miner utilizes a more modern interface and is available for all major hardware platforms. Joining a mining pool. After you have the hardware and the software in place, the next thing you are going to want to do is join a mining pool for your chosen cryptocurrency. A mining pool is a loose affiliation of miners who join together for the purpose of verifying blocks as quickly as possible. The rewards for doing so are then shared amongst all of the miners who contributed computational power to the process. While joining a mining pool is optional, it is recommended as the number of blocks you will be part of mining will be much higher than it would otherwise be if you decided to go it alone. This is due to the fact that the amount of computational power required to generate an accurate proof of work for most blockchains in a reasonable period of time is on the rise which means mining pools have quickly become the new norm for nearly all blockchains that see serious use. Those who contribute to solving a proof then receive a share of the profits based on one of several different compensation models. If you decide to go it alone, then you will need to download what is known as the core client to keep your machine in sync with the blockchain as a whole. This client can be downloaded from the cryptocurrency in question's primary website, Assuming you do choose to participate in a mining pool, all you will need to do is follow the instructions of the pool manager and make sure to always engage in behavior that is in agreement with the terms of the use of the blockchain in question. Choosing the right mining pool for you can be quite a complicated process simply because there are so many active ones to choose from. The best way to see what options are available for your cryptocurrency of choice is going to be by searching for it on Reddit. This will also allow you to read comments about each 
so that you don't sign up with a lemon. While joining up with one of the most popular pools means you will be in the running for more potential verifications, it also means that you will receive a smaller share of the compensation that you will receive for your work. Additionally, the overall hash rate distribution is always going to remain higher when split among a larger overall selection of mining pools. It is generally considered better for the health of the blockchain if you choose a mining pool that is somewhat smaller, though still large enough to ensure that a steady string of proofs is generated on a regular basis. Making a Profit Assuming you sign up with a mining pool, determining your share of the profits is also going to be a complicated process. There are a wide variety of different ways that compensation is calculated, which means you are going to want to be familiar with the most popular ones before you choose a mining pool to sign up with to ensure you know what you are really getting into. The pay per share, or PPS model of compensation, pays out miners as soon as the block has been mined with a set amount for each share of the proof that is solved by that miner's machine. Miners are paid out from the balance that the pool currently holds, which means that they can take their share of the profits without waiting for the transaction to be verified by the chain and payment to be transferred. This is the payment structure that allows for the least amount of variance in what miners can expect to receive, and it leaves the brunt of the risk on the pool operator should anyone not go according to plan. As there are always risks that a payout might not go through as anticipated, even when a proof is created successfully, PPS payments require the operator to have a large reserve of the cryptocurrency in question in order to remain solvent during the prolonged periods of bad luck. As such, the PPS model is not especially common anymore among most of the more popular types of cryptocurrency. The proportional approach to mining offers a distribution of the rewards for mining a block in proportional amount so that each miner receives an amount in proportion to the portion of the proof that they provided. Payments are then generated once the block has been accepted by the blockchain and payment has been delivered. The pay per last N share or PPLN payment method is generally similar to the proportional method except it works based on N shares instead of traditional shares. The main difference between this and the PPS method, which offers a set rate for each share, is that N shares pay out based on the amount that is generated per block, which means the amount each miner will be paid varies as well. Payments are then generated after they have been paid out by the blockchain. The Double Geometric Payment Method, or DGM, is a hybrid approach that ensures any inherent risk is split between the pool manager and the miners. The manager receives a portion of the profits when the pool is mining a lot of blocks and then returns a portion of that to the miners when things are slow or the work the pool is doing is extremely complex. The payments are then based on shares and are paid out once the block has been accepted to the blockchain. The Shared Maximum Pay Per Share Model, or SMPPS, is a variation of the Pay Per Share Model that is used more frequently these days. It offers a set amount per share that fluctuates based on the amount of rewards the pool has earned over a set period of time. Payments are made once the time period has elapsed and the blockchains have been accepted by the chain. The recently shared Maximum Per Pay Share Model, or RSMPPS, is similar to the SMPPS, but it prioritizes the newest members of the pool so that new miners are more likely to get shares than those that have been in the pool the longest. Payments are made on a set schedule once the blocks have been verified and accepted into the chain. The capped pay per share with recent back pay, or CPPSRB model, works via a variation of the MPPS model and pays out miners to the maximum degree possible based on the blocks it gains access to while also ensuring that the pool never goes bankrupt as a result. Payments are made after the blocks have been verified and accepted. The pooled mining model, or PMM, also known as the slush pool, is a method of payment whereby later shares of a given block are given a higher percentage when compared to earlier shares as they often require more resources to mine effectively. This method also has the benefit of making it difficult for miners to switch horses midstream in an effort to maximize their personal profits.
Payments are made after the block has been mined successfully and accepted into the chain. The pay on target, or POT model of payment, is another variation on the standard PPS model that pays out its miners based on the amount of resources each used in order to help mine the block successfully. Payments are made after the round has finished and the block has been verified by the blockchain. The SCORE model of payment is an approach that utilizes a reward system that is proportionally weighed and distributed based on the amount of time that elapses based on when a block was taken and when it was finished. It also pays out a weighted amount to later shares of the proof to compensate for their added difficulty. Payments are then calculated based on scores given to each miner, not based on shares. Payments are made after the round has finished and the block has been accepted to the blockchain. The Allegis payment model was created by the person who created BFG Miner and looks to take the strengths of the PPS model along with those of the BPM model. It generates shares for the miners that can be paid out as soon as the work is completed. Once the rewards for the block come in, they are then divided equally amongst all the shares that went into the block with stale blocks, those that could not be completed, having their shares rolled over into the shares of the next successfully completed block. Payments are only sent through once a miner earns at least .67108864 of the shares of a given block, with lesser amounts being paid out once the miner doesn't mine anything for seven days. If a miner doesn't have enough shares, then their shares are rolled over into the next block as well. The triple mining payment method puts together multiple smaller pools with no extra fees and then gives each miner 1% of each block to mine. This typically results in miners who receive larger shares overall when compared to other types of payment methods. The managers who run this process then take a portion of the profits from each block to add to a jackpot that the miner who originally found the block is awarded. This means that everyone in the grouped together pools then has a proportionally greater chance to make an additional profit, regardless of the processing power that they bring to the table. Chapter 6. Avoiding Fraud Due to the fact that the cryptocurrency market is extremely unregulated and the amount of money floating around in it currently, scammers are trying every conceivable method possible to make money off of those who are ignorant to the risks they face. This chapter outlines a wide variety of ways that scammers are trying to take advantage of the cryptocurrency market today, but it is important to keep in mind that they are always looking for new ways to get one over on you, which means it is important that you never do business with any company that isn't reputable in order to ensure that your money stays safely where it belongs. Fake Exchanges While some cryptocurrency exchanges are less reputable than others, most at least try to provide a legitimate service to consumers. This is not the case with exchanges at the bottom of the barrel, however, as they are typically fake from the start and are simply looking to take money from the uninformed and vanish into the ether with it. The easiest way to determine if an exchange is a scam or not is based on its advertisements. If the exchange is offering to sell you a cryptocurrency at a flat rate that is below the current market value, then there is a 95% chance that they are only looking to take your money. Cryptocurrency exchanges work in the same way that any other exchange does, which is to say that users buy and sell currency to one another. As no user is going to expect less than market value for their cryptocurrency, this is a red flag that something fishy is going on. The other red flag you should be aware of is if you come across an exchange that is offering to buy your cryptocurrency directly through PayPal. This is also not how exchanges work. If you buy into a particular exchange using your cryptocurrency, then that cryptocurrency doesn't leave your possession until someone else has paid for it through legitimate channels. These types of scams have you enter your PayPal details, then tell you to send your cryptocurrency to another address, typically found on a QR code, so it is especially easy for them to change it when the jig is up. Of course, once you send off your bitcoins, the promised payment will never materialize and you will not be able to get in contact with the exchange directly. In general, it is never a good idea to sell your cryptocurrency outside the boundaries of a reputable exchange. 
fake wallets. Spotting a fake cryptocurrency wallet can be more difficult than spotting a fake exchange simply due to the fact that they store your cryptocurrency as opposed to buying and selling it, which means the fraudulent part is generally going to come in the form of malicious software that will attack your phone or computer in an effort to steal your personal data. Officially sanctioned wallets can typically be found on the primary website for the cryptocurrency in question. The easiest way to determine if a given wallet is fake or not is to listen to your instincts and consider if anything about the website seems off. Additionally, you are going to want to avoid websites whose URL does not include HTTPS at the start, as this means it is not secured, which means you wouldn't want to enter your personal details anyway. Before downloading the wallet of your choice, you are going to want to ensure that you entered the URL correctly, as similar but misspelled URLs often lead to fraudulent sites. Furthermore, if the wallet you are planning on using isn't online, and instead a file that you download, you are going to want to ensure that you scan it for known malware before you install it to your hard drive. If you don't have virus software on your computer, you can use the site virustotal.com to check it for you. Finally, it is always recommended that you choose a wallet that the cryptocurrency community that you now belong to approves of to see if other people have had success when using the wallet you are thinking about storing your hard-earned cryptocurrency in. Phishing Scams Another scam that you are likely to see a lot of is the cryptocurrency phishing scam. This scam involves the scammer trying to trick you into thinking they are an authority from either the website for the cryptocurrency you are using or from the exchange you are a part of. They will generally tend to recommend that you visit some website, which will then proceed to ruin your day. The most common version of this scam involves sending you an email requesting your presence, though group pop-up advertisements may work the same way. Either way, the end result is either going to infect your computer with malware or end with the scammer trying to steal your cryptocurrency directly. If you receive an email that doesn't seem entirely on the level, the first thing you are going to want to do is to never take the bait. This can be easier said than done, however, as the email may very well appear legitimate, either because the exchange you use has had their database hacked or because the scammer has gotten a hold of your email address via other nefarious means. Regardless, the best practice is going to involve never opening any proffered attachments or clicking on hyperlinks in emails whose senders you cannot verify. If you have legitimate business with the website in question, instead of responding to that email, visit the site directly and look for contact details before asking a real person about it. Another common tactic that scammers use is to create an official-looking hyperlink, but this can be countered by looking at the URL it is sending you to by simply holding your cursor over it and looking at the website address that pops up. Finally, you will always want to verify the address of the person who sent the email. While it is possible that the address is fake or was spoofed, this will often give you an idea of whether or not it is on the level. More than anything else, Knowing that these scams are out there should make it easier to avoid them. When it comes to dealing with fake online advertisements, it is important that you are careful about the sites you go to online. The most common way that unsuspecting users get pulled into these types of phishing scams is by doing an online search for something related to cryptocurrency and then clicking on the first link that comes up without even really looking at it. This is a poor choice, however, as this first link is almost always going to be sponsored content and just as frequently lead to a scam of one type or another. You can avoid this risk completely by simply knowing where you are going online and entering the URL in question directly. Ponzi Scams The exact specifics of a cryptocurrency Ponzi scam might vary, but they all have one thing in common. They require that you send in your cryptocurrency in exchange for a better-than-average return on your investment. The most common version of this type of scam claims that it can double the amount of cryptocurrency that you provide them within a short amount of time. They are also easy to spot due to the fact that they typically work on a referral system that encourages those who are already part of the program to get those whom they know to sign up as well. 
If you come across a site that is offering you a commission to get other users to take part in the program, or if you come across the recommendation in an online forum, then there is a good chance the program is part of a Ponzi scam. If you are unsure of the validity of a given program, the best place to stay up to date on what is legitimate and what is not is the Reddit page for the cryptocurrency in question. Mining Pools this is one of the more difficult types of scams to suss out, simply because it will likely appear on the level, at least at first. Odds are, when you sign up with a fake mining pool, you will receive payments as if you were actually validating blocks, though you will likely be asked to pay a fee to become a part of the pool. The money you make from the pool is actually going to be a portion of the fees that have been collected by other miners, which means it is likely to decrease over time as word about what the mining pool really is leaked out to the community. As always, you are going to want to start by trusting your instincts and checking out the relevant forums in order to determine if anyone else has previously had trouble with the mining pool. If the pool is new, then it might not have much of a presence on these sites, but it will be a good way to weed out those that have already been identified as scams. Additionally, when it comes to signing up for a mining pool, it is always important to track down the one you are going to use for yourself and never follow any referral links as these will rarely lead to reputable options. When looking into these services, you will need to keep an eye out for a handful of different details that legitimate pools will provide. This includes things like the pool that they mine from, and the ability to choose the pool you wish to contribute your hash rate to. You will also want to be aware of the limits that are expressed in terms of the maximum hash rate that the mining pool can handle, as very few legitimate pools have access to anything close to an unlimited amount due to the fact that hardware of this type is expensive and it takes time to both deploy and acquire. Fake services will not have any limitations in this area, often because they aren't doing any actual mining in the first place. While this type of scam might seem relatively benign if you are still making a profit, it is important to keep in mind that unlike with a legitimate service, these payments are going to decrease over time, if they come in at all. Along these lines, it is also easy to determine if a mining pool is a scam if their site starts to cut the rates required to buy into the program. Scammers will typically continue cutting the required rates as low as they need to in order to keep attracting new marks. This process will continue until no one is left who will bite, at which point they will take the money they made and the mining operation will fold. Due to the fact that once you buy in, they have your money, these types of scams can often go on for months, if not years, as long as the mining pool keeps attracting interest. You will also want to keep an eye out for mining pools that have an endorsement from a registered ASIC vendor. These vendors provide a large majority of all the mining machines used by mining pools, and 9 out of 10 will provide the pools whose machines they have provided with a certificate logo or a post lending credence to the operation. There is no downside for them when it comes to this type of thing, as it is a free advertisement while also improving consumer confidence in their brand. If you are thinking about a mining pool that can't provide this information, think twice. Along similar lines, the mining pool should be able to readily provide pictures of their hardware and data center. And if this information isn't on their website directly, then they should be able to provide it to you by request. Regardless of what they say in response, this is a request that only shows you are being careful with your money. If you receive anything but the requested pictures, then you will know the operation is a scam. Chapter 7. The Future of Cryptocurrency the cryptocurrency market is in the midst of a boom phase that has the market in an extreme state of fluctuation as there are so many different cryptocurrencies competing for dominance despite the fact that only a small handful of these are seeing any real type of adoption rate. This fierce competition makes it difficult to determine what the future holds with any significant rate of certainty. However, there are some things that can be intuited by experts based on trends that are currently emerging. Increasing Scrutiny When it first appeared in 2009, Bitcoin's main benefit was the fact that it was completely decentralized, which meant all of its transactions took place anonymously. 
Those in the know instantly started taking advantage of this fact in order to do all manner of illegal things on the dark net, primarily via the Silk Road marketplace. Now that cryptocurrency is starting to become more mainstream, governmental and regulatory agencies around the world, including the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network in the U.S. alone, are all giving it much more attention. This increasing level of scrutiny began ramping up in 2013, when the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network first began issuing rulings that declared cryptocurrency exchanges were actually money service businesses, which meant they had to follow government regulations. The Department of Homeland Security soon followed up on this ruling by freezing the accounts of the biggest Bitcoin exchange the world had seen at that time, called Mt. Gox, most of which were held by Wells Fargo, due to the concerns related to money laundering. This directly led to an April 2017 ruling by the Securities and Exchange Commission to deny an application by Bitcoin to open an official cryptocurrency exchange trade fund, a move that caused a noticeable decrease in the cryptocurrency's price, though not for long. This denial of the application is currently under review in the summer of 2017. This has left cryptocurrency in a bit of an odd situation, as their increasing popularity has led them to additional levels of government scrutiny and required regulation which directly goes against the reasons they were created in the first place. Additionally, while the number of regular users is growing every day, it is still a small portion of the numbers that will ultimately be needed in order for cryptocurrency to reach a mass saturation point. If these issues have not been solved by the time this level of acceptance is reached, it is unlikely that they ever will. In order for cryptocurrency to reach a true level of mainstream status and become a true part of the incumbent financial system, it is going to need to be able to stay true to its original purpose and also remain complex enough that its overall level of scrutiny remains at or above the current level of security protocols. On the other hand, it would need to become easy enough for the average person to truly understand. It would also need to be decentralized enough that it can still be recognized as adjacent to its original form while still having checks in place to ensure that unsavory activities like tax evasion and money laundering can't proceed unchecked. This means that the cryptocurrencies of the future might be more of an amalgamation of its current form and the more traditional types of fiat currencies. Governmental Oversight U.S. While the United States is currently actively looking into a way to ensure that bitcoins aren't being used as a means to launder money, nor as a way to fund illegal activity, analysts who are in the know also say that the federal government is currently working out plans for issuing its own form of cryptocurrency as well, to more effectively cut the problems off at the source and not have to deal with the wrangling of uncooperative technology in the first place. This idea, which is being referred to unofficially as FedCoin, posits that the Federal Reserve, as a national bank, could create a unique type of cryptocurrency with relative ease. All that it would have to do is create its own blockchain and then generate the required genesis block. FedCoins could then be easily exchanged for actual dollars at a rate of one to one, at least at first. The only real difference between FedCoin and other cryptocurrencies currently in existence would be in the fact that a single user, namely the federal government, would then be able to create new blocks at will or destroy those it had reason to believe were being used to finance illegal activities. This could be done by simply forking the protocol of Bitcoin, or more likely Ethereum, and then adjust the reward for mining blocks based on its own needs. This would lead to a type of cryptocurrency that would be both decentralized when it came to the individual transaction and centralized when it came to limiting supply and monitoring those previously anonymous transactions. While this might seem like something of a conspiracy theory, the fact of the matter is that the authorities of the Federal Reserve met with Bitcoin authorities in a closed-door meeting in the fall of 2016. Janet Yellen, the chair of the Federal Reserve, oversaw the conference herself, which also included banking heavyweights from the World Bank, the Bank for International Settlements, and the International Monetary Fund, and more. Officially, 
the focus of the meeting was on utilizing blockchain as a means of improving the efficacy of intra-banking transfers, but insiders say that issuing a federal cryptocurrency was also a topic that was discussed at length. The CEO of the company Chain, a blockchain-based company, even delivered a speech with the title Why Central Banks Will Issue Digital Currencies, during which he urged governments to take control of cryptocurrencies themselves. One of the most pressing arguments for FedCoin seems to be the Federal Reserve's desire to stabilize cryptocurrency as a whole by connecting it directly to physical money. This link would not need to be voluntary either, as the new FedCoin would likely be optional at first, but eventually it would be harder and harder to find physical money in use anywhere. Russia Russia experienced a serious change of heart when it comes to cryptocurrencies in 2017. They announced that cryptocurrency use was legalized after a statement in 2016 indicated that those who used the digital currency could face jail time. The reason behind this abrupt 180 seems to stem from Russia's currently ongoing problem with corruption in its banking sector. Since 2014, the Russian economy has been under extreme strain due to a decrease in oil prices combined with foreign sanctions that have extremely curtailed foreign investment. This, in turn, has led to heightened costs when it comes to accessing money, which has led to a decline in the banking sector. This downturn comes during a serious push by the Russian Central Bank to combat corruption at all levels amidst fears that many banks have been removing capital from the country via complex money laundering schemes. As of summer 2017, more than 100 banks have been closed in the past three years, with nearly that many being expected to close by 2019. This has been a serious financial drain on the country to the tune of more than $50 billion so far. This process has also brought to light concerns about liquidity for the country as a whole, and the feeling among analysts is that the central bank needs to tread carefully or risk provoking a crisis of epic magnitude. Thus, the change in cryptocurrency policy. As an added bonus, an increased focus on digital currencies would decrease the importance of the interpersonal relationship between region administrators, local businesses, and banks, which ideally decrease corruption levels as well. The current system of credit in Russia is practically opaque to the point that central bank authorities often don't even know who is involved in the regional banking system, and smaller banks are essentially autonomous. This problem apparently hasn't been solved by the bank closing spree, and fraud is still rampant, which is why the Russian government has been experimenting with a variety of technical applications designed to make it easier for them to identify transactions in real time. The use of a variation of the FedCoin is not what the national government is currently interested in, and they currently have their attention focused on blockchain technology in general. Specifically, they are interested in the ease with which it allows individual transactions to be tracked. It is currently unclear if Russia is planning to adapt the existing Bitcoin blockchain for its own ends, or if it is planning on creating its own via new legislation. On the other hand, it may be planning to make use of the existing platform for a time, while allowing its own banks to develop their own system, or take a closer look at the system as a means of better understanding how blockchain can help to mitigate their financial woes. It is also currently unclear if the leadership in Moscow is going to support or fight against these changes, though the announced change in cryptocurrency policy gives strong indications of the former as opposed to the latter. China once again, China proves that it is at the forefront of the cryptocurrency revolution, as they announced in June of 2017 that the People's Bank of China created the first prototype of its own digital currency that has the ability to scale seamlessly based on the number of transactions that take place in a day. While the exact details are not clear, speeches and research papers that have been released on the topic apparently indicate that the bank is planning to release the cryptocurrency to the public at the same time as the renminbi, though no official timetable is available for when exactly that might be. Despite the lack of a firm rollout date, the cryptocurrency has already been tested by transactions between the People's Bank and several of the country's leading commercial banks. This testing is a significant step for the idea of officially sanctioned cryptocurrencies and shows that China is extremely committed to exploring the logistical, 
technical, and economic challenges involved in developing its own digital currency, which is sure to have far-reaching implications for the global financial system and its economy in particular. This is due to the fact that a digital fiat currency, a cryptocurrency that is backed by a central bank and essentially has the same status as a banknote, would serve to dramatically lower the transaction costs associated with all financial transactions, which would go a long way towards making financial services more widely available to the parts of the world that do not currently have access to these services. It would also mark a significant step forward for China as a whole, as there are millions there who still lack the types of banking services that those many countries take for granted. Perhaps more important to the Chinese government than improving its people's access to these services is the fact that a centralized cryptocurrency would give them more control over the types of digital transaction that have become extremely popular in China over the past few years. Additionally, a centralized digital currency would be easier to track, which would make it easier for the government to crack down on corruption as well. Also of interest to policymakers, this type of digital system would make it easier to offer real-time insight into the local economy, which could benefit the country as a whole as well. It will also make it easier to expand the reach of the renminbi, as intra-country transactions would be much easier to complete, and the currency would be easier to obtain than it is via current methods. Other countries are also going to be interested in the results of China's cryptocurrency project, as it is said to integrate smoothly with the central banking system. The new cryptocurrency is said to provide cryptocurrency wallets to the central banking branches, which would make it easy for anyone to set up a digital account that uses the new cryptocurrency. Also of interest is the fact that the cryptocurrency is said to not be based on the traditional blockchain architecture that powers virtually every cryptocurrency on the market today. Rather, it makes use of a limited distributed ledger system as a means of getting around the potential for bottlenecks that are inherent in many blockchains. Instead, it only accesses the digital ledger to occasionally update its records and determine who holds what and how long they have been holding it. Conclusion Thank you for making it through to the end of Cryptocurrency How to Make a Lot of Money Investing and Trading in Cryptocurrency Let's hope it was informative and able to provide you with all of the tools you need to achieve your goals, whatever it is they may be. Just because you finished this book doesn't mean there is nothing left to learn on the topic. Expanding your horizons is the only way to find the mastery you seek. As you have no doubt realized, cryptocurrency is still in a state of extreme fluctuation, which means that the only way to truly stay on the forefront of what is happening in the market is to make lifelong learning a habit. If you instead decide to rest on your laurels, you never know when you might miss out on crucial news or the next big thing. Eventually, things will settle down into a relatively stable status quo, but that won't happen anytime soon. The next thing you are going to want to do is to stop reading already and to get ready to start making money from this unprecedented time in history of currency. Never again in your lifetime will you see so many different currencies competing for dominance in a market that will ultimately be able to support only a few of them. This means that in order to make the right decisions to prevent yourself from backing the wrong horse, you are going to need to do your homework and never make a move without fully considering all of your options. It is also important to keep in mind that, even more so than other types of investing, investing in cryptocurrency is far from a sure thing. This is a fact you are going to have to come to terms with, as it is equally likely that you will lose your investment, as it is that you will make the type of choice that leads to a serious payout in the future. Overall, it is key that you remember that a serious windfall is unlikely to fall into your lap anytime soon, and that investing in cryptocurrency is a marathon, not a sprint. Slow and steady wins the race. Finally, if you found this book useful in any way, a review on Amazon is always appreciated. This has been Cryptocurrency. How to Make a Lot of Money Investing and Trading in Cryptocurrency Unlocking the Lucrative World of Cryptocurrency Cryptocurrency Investing and Trading Book 1 
Written by Andrew Johnson. Narrated by Nikki Gallo. Copyright 2017 by Andrew Johnson. Production copyright 2017 by Andrew Johnson. Thanks for listening. You just listened to Blockchain, Uncovering Blockchain Technology, Cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, and the Future of Money, Blockchain and Cryptocurrency Exposed, written by Alan Wright, narrated by Scott Miller, and Cryptocurrency, How to Make a Lot of Money Investing and Trading in Cryptocurrency, Unlocking the Lucrative World of Cryptocurrency, written by Andrew Johnson, and narrated by Nikki Gaio. These have been a collection of blockchain, the complete guide to uncovering Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin technology, and the future of money. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.